we'll call the meeting to order. This is, oh, actually we've already called the meeting to order. We're out of executive session, um, so we're back in regular session. Um, uh, announcements, um, we have two already on the agenda. Um, I'll, I'll do the March 30th meeting. We have a joint meeting with Miami Township trustees here in council chambers, and that will be at 7 p.m. Uh, it's been a long time since we've met with Miami Township trustees. So we do have a lot to talk about. We have the CETA, we have um, the property of the CBE, uh, firehouse, lots of joint, lots of joint projects to talk about. Uh, Brian? Yeah, so uh, we've confirmed the date for the next uh, local policing forum, which uh, we're starting to call Community Conversations. Uh, the uh, agenda for that meeting, there are three main topics, is uh, on the table and in the packet. Uh, one of the things that I think will be uh, very important for council and citizens is talking about the ACE task force and uh, you know pros and cons so that we can ultimately uh, look at that uh, more closely. Um, that's going to be, uh, by the way, uh, a correction on the agenda. That's We move that to the Bryan Center Gymnasium, uh, just anticipating that we might have more folks so that we don't run out of room like we did the last time. Um, otherwise, seven and nine, and uh, the agenda's there. And I also wanted to uh, announce the Arts Council, Art Council's uh, member show that's going to be opening this Friday. And uh, as some of you know, uh, Council supported uh, one of the awards that's going to go to an artist, and actually it's going to be the People's Choice Award, which is uh, appropriate. That's the award that gets voted on. So. Uh, so the best artist uh, by vote will win. Anything else? Any other announcements? Okay. Um, next we go to review of the minutes of December 18th. It was a special council meeting um, that involved police chief interviews. I did, I, I did correct the spelling. Oh, uh, I was going to ask you about that. <laughs> <laughs> on my version, I did get a heads up on that. Okay. Um, page one, page two, page three. I guess we don't have any comment on page four. Signature line. Um, all in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Uh, next are the minutes of our last council meeting, February 2nd. Um, on page one, page two, page three, four, five, six, seven, eight. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Motion. Oh, I'm sorry. Motion to approve. So moved. Second. Second. Thank you. I didn't make that on the first one, didn't I? No, I was hoping you'd just remember the second time. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, now, a uh, review of the agenda. Do we need to add or move anything around? Um, yeah, I have some things. Um, one, with, uh, I want to nominate Mark Ewald to be on What can we do? You can do that during during that during okay. that. Um, goals. Right, we, that needs to be added. That'll okay. be under that'll be under old business. business. Okay. Um, I thought we had said we were going to talk about sidewalks at every meeting. Is that no we're waiting for Jason to come back the first meeting in March. Okay. Um, the minutes of our last meeting said that we were going to have the water softening options meeting date at this meeting okay. but we the uh work session got moved to the 28th i think it is and so we won't have them until <coughs> we'll have that date it'll probably be the second week of march for the public meeting and the last thing um i had some things i wanted to just bring up about our financial reports is there when we talk about it during um during when it's on the agenda during reports yeah reports, yeah okay. And I thought I just heard some ringing or jingling. So if anybody has a cell phone on or any kind of device, please turn it off. Thank you. Um, so do we did okay on the, we're, we're, we're good on the minutes now. Okay, petitions and communications. Um, Lori, if you'd like to review those. Yeah. 
Anticipated taking 45 minutes to learn how to input your data, so uh, everyone's welcome. Um, I have a question. How are you liaising? I had a conversation actually with the citizen who's here tonight <laughs> about the bus service, and I'm wondering, like green green cats, um, <coughs> is HRC liaising with with an organization like that that's not in the village? Yes. To make sure they get up. Right. Anyone that provides a service to the village in the region would. Could be on the on the uh, website. Right, but has anybody reached yeah. out to them to say we'd like you to? We to we service? have, but I mean honestly, a lot of follow up is going to have to happen. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the things that we're planning to do, and they did this in Logan County, we're basically copying what they did, is anyone that didn't come to these trainings, I probably shouldn't say this, they would input their information and then say, hey, we've got it in there, check it out. Um, right, right, and that's why we have a Miller fellow to uh, who's going to be working full time next quarter. <coughs> so, so that we'll get it all in there. Okay. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Um, and uh, Tim Freer had a thank you to the HRC. HRC provided some scholarship support for the Washington D.C. trip for the eighth graders. Um, they're hoping to build up a foundation, kind of a foundation for supporting that, as I understand. So that there's always money for people, so that the whole age grade class can go. Um, John Hudson wrote us about um, uh, opposing uh, requiring property owners to have uh, responsibility for sidewalk repair. Um, <coughs> I didn't really understand the high school ninja workshop. We just got some evaluations. Um, I'm not sure why that was. Included. Those are actually attachments to the HRC annual report. Oh. Okay, that was my whole thing. Um, and um, so the community, we had a note from the community access panel regarding the possibility of a Facebook page and helping to put local film and media producers in contact with Village Cable Channel. Um, uh, uh, Side Ellen Holyoke wrote us about. Um, <coughs> Uh, the Arcans project, hoping to get uh, businesses and individuals to um, donate for some more decorated um, cans, such as the ones we've already put downtown. Um, we got a note from Marriage Matters Ohio regarding sample legislation from Athens in this case, supporting marriage equality and LGBT rights in Ohio. And the Public Arts Commission had the VITA um, can I start the award? Yeah. Um, Brian, are you going to be recommending the marriage equality? Yeah, as I thought. Part of your HRC? Report? Yeah, I thought I'd wait for okay. that. Okay, good. Sorry, I'm in kind of a roll here. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then the Charter Review Committee has named its chair, vice chair, and secretary to begin meeting soon. Uh, oh, and then the, in the online things, we often, I, we get lots of newsletters and things from area agencies. I just want to point out that the Green County Treasurer um, reminded us that property taxes are due by Friday the 20th. So if you have property taxes, and there were a few changes. They noted Fifth Third Bank used to collect, used to have payment places, but they're not doing that anymore. So you might want to look online at our online packet or information about any changes or just check your check your bill and read it carefully. If you paid one way, it might be a little different this time. Um, 
Did I get out of there? There was a lot. <laughs> there was a lot. And there were a few things that seemed to be repeated. And I know, I, I wonder why. I I, yeah, confused. some of this. I mean, actually, there was the thank you from the Arts Council for our donation. Oh, yeah, and that wasn't listed. Yes, there was a, a thank you from the Arts Council for a donation. From <coughs> oh, am I picking up the gas now? Yeah. Okay. Oh. No, there's just one. I. Sorry, they wanted. <laughs> we talked about whether to have copies of everything oh, at other okay. places. Okay. Yeah. Uh, All right. <laughs> so okay. next on the agenda is uh, legislation. Um, we have resolution 2015-05, appointing Christopher Connor to Coolidge Wall as village solicitor. Judy, would, would you please read that? Yes. Whereas Christopher R. Connor, attorney at law of Coolidge Wall, LPA for the very first list. West First Street Suite 600 feet in Ohio was appointed in September 2013 to serve as the solicitor for the village of Yellow Springs to serve at the pleasure of council in accordance with the village charter. And whereas this employment contract was in effect from September 16, 2013 until September 16, 2014, and has continued on a month to month basis since then, now therefore the council for the village of Yellow Springs, Ohio, for my result that section one, Christopher R. Connor, attorney at law, school as well, and Etc. be appointed to serve as solicitor for the village of Yellow Springs, Ohio, and to serve at the pleasure of counsel. Section 2, Amy Blankenship, attorney at law of Coolidge Wall, etc., shall be appointed to serve as assistant solicitor for the village of Yellow Springs, Ohio, or to serve at the pleasure of counsel. Section 3, the duties of the village solicitor shall be those provided for in the charter. Section 4, the village solicitor shall be paid for ordinary and extraordinary services as provided for in the attached contract or in a substantially similar document. Section 5, the President of Council of the Village of Yellow Springs is hereby authorized to execute the attached contract. Section 6, this resolution shall take effect and be in full force beginning March 1, 2015. Thank you. Can I have a motion, please? So moved. Second. Okay. Um, we took quite a bit of time. Um, we haven't, uh, we didn't go out uh, to look for uh, an attorney solicitor <coughs> for nearly 10 years. Um, we've been with Coolidge Wall for that long. It, it may have actually been more than that, um, 2002. So it was it was a long period of time. We were, um, we have a great relationship with them. There's a lot of institutional knowledge, but we just felt that for um, just to give ourselves a check, to check, you know, what other firms are out there, to check rates, because we have been um, uh, our, our fees for, for solicitor services have been high in the past few years, that it was something that um, the citizenry deserved. If we could save some money, um, that we should be doing that. And um, as it ends up, we actually were able to, um, the, the contract proposed by Coolidge Wall is really quite uh, beneficial. Um, they are basically proposing a retainer they will be coming to all of our meetings. Um, they will be providing <coughs> our services for a retainer of uh, $57,000. $47,000 a month? A year. And that will include the charter review, which in itself will be quite extensive. There, there may be projects outside the scope of that, that if there would happen to be a lawsuit or if there would happen to be something outside the norm of what they would normally be doing for us, there would be extra extra fees. But it is it is quite a good contract and we are going to be getting um, work from Amy Blankenship, who is the assistant, and from Chris. So I think that council um, all felt very positive about um, continuing the relationship. We're glad we um, we're glad we opened it up. We're, we're glad we explored it, but um, we're, we're definitely satisfied with the proposal we received from Coolidge Wall. Patty, any other comments? Uh, no, I just uh, appreciate the, everyone who submitted their packets um, for, for the process, and, and um, I appreciate that Council put so much time in and did such a great job and for a job, and uh, I look forward to working with Chris, continuing to work with Chris. Any other comments from Council? Comments from citizens? Judy? Just a resolution. <coughs> I know, I just, we always. I, you said Judy. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Judy, I, 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 I called you Judy. Oh. Judy. Oh, good. <laughs> I go public. Okay. I'm going to try to read this because I know I've got all the minutes. I'm going to try to read it really 
with this. But um, anyway, I'm really glad to hear you decided to go with Coolidge Wall and Chris, because um, I think he's the, he's a smart guy. He knows the village is committed, and uh, he has a lot of institutional memory. Uh, he's very capable of meeting the needs of the village. I did want to comment on his recommendation to be present for all the council meetings. I think it's a bad idea. Um, and the reason I think it's, uh, first of all, ultimately it seems like it's got to cost more in the long run. It may not cost more this year, but that's a lot of time commitment. And for a small village, you guys are capable of discussing with citizens and making decisions without having legal counsel here. I feel that uh, there's other ways to do it. You know, for the council to keep, for the solicitor to keep track of what's happening in the village. They can review the minutes, the president can talk, you know, have a regular five week, you know, every other week uh, discussion about what happens at council meetings that could be kept in a much more time efficient way. And part of the reason, uh, but the main reason um, that I feel like it's a bad idea is because I feel like council often wants to turn to the uh, expert. Is it, you know, to turn to uh, when Chris is at the meetings and ask his opinion, and I think that could really interfere with democratic decision making. Having a, you know, lawyer up there when the citizens are trying to make, uh, you know, a case for something with the council, uh, I think it can really shut down debate. When I was on council <coughs> and, and Chris was at the meetings, I remember that council members uh, frequently enough would ask his opinion about things. And luckily, I think, he often would decline to give his opinion because he would say, that's, that's not for me to decide, that's for you guys to decide. Um, as a person with progressive politics, I found that technical experts, and this includes legal counsel, but also other technical experts who often have a rather status quo view of what's possible and what's right, who are at our meetings, often commented in a way that made it more difficult to present a progressive alternative and often enough they were wrong when we think about the recommendations about our electric electric substation about the coal plants that we decided not to follow those recommendations which would have been quite costly and they in the end they would have been very poor decisions uh, that we made and I don't Chris is great but at some point you're gonna have another solicitor it's not you know if you get into the habit of always having them here you know, they may not be as judicious as he has been about not getting involved in political discourse, which I don't think is his proper role, would be his proper role. So um, that's basically it. So I think <coughs> I encourage you to relook at that part of what of the agreement. Thank you. Thanks, Judith. Anyone else? Okay, bring back to the table. Any other comments? <coughs> I mean, I think, yeah. Well, actually, Patty, would you share um, your experience with uh, uh, law directors sitting at council meetings? Um, in my previous position, we always had the law director at the council meetings. Um, <coughs> he was there to answer the questions that council had. Um, he didn't necessarily jump into the discussion unless asked by council for some information or some uh, type of advice or thought, you know, that he had, but he was always present at the council meeting. <coughs> I think that the that the part of the prevailing opinion is is that, and and Chris's reason is that he tends to get at things or hear about things or learn about issues so far after the fact that he's playing catch up, and I think. He wants to be a little bit more present, and again, I think it's I, I think it's up to council to not involve him unless, you know, and, and definitely keep him out of the political process. I think my feeling would be it would be something I I want I, I want to try. I want to see how it works since we haven't been doing it, and um, I believe that um, I mean we're probably one of the only local governments that doesn't have an attorney sitting at the table with them, um, advising them at every meeting. So uh, I think that's, um, and, and all of the, I think all of the proposals actually were, um, that we received, were recommending that we have them at, at all of the meetings. So um, can, can you think of uh, any instances since you've been on council for a long time where you wish that, where, <coughs> the situation actually did occur that 
the attorney came in <coughs> after the fact and it would have been better had they been involved earlier on? Uh, I think uh, I think it's more of just under a kind of a day-to-day -day understanding of of all of the, of how how everything works together. I don't know that there is a particular case um, that I could that I could cite. Um, you know, anytime we did have a legal issue, typically the attorney's been here um, because we've asked them. Um, I think it's I think it's a matter of them getting a better understanding of the community and a better understanding of the inter interaction between council and the community. So I think in some respects, it almost, in a community like Yellow Springs, sets a better tone for how we hear from our citizens and how we interact act with our citizens. I think it gives legal counsel actually a better understanding of the importance we place on citizen input and democracy and, and collaborative decision making. I hear uh, Judith's point, and I think it's a good one, a serious one to consider. Um, it does seem to be standard practice in, from also John uh, reported that he's never really heard of any place that didn't, didn't follow this practice. That, um, you know, and I realize Yellow Springs is different, um, but we are also the same. You're in the same legal environment that every other municipality uh, faces. So I, I think maybe council will need to be very clear about how we want to interact with the solicitor. I think we can try it for this year. We're sort of looking at this as we got a very good contract offer from Coolidge, uh, Coolidge Wall this year. And uh, I would see this as part of a kind of a trial. Let's see if this does help. Because it, one thing we do find is that if they don't know about something, it does seem like there's catch up that has to happen, and we end up paying for the catch up. Um, and so this may actually be a way to reduce costs because we're not paying for them to catch up. Uh, so I, but I hear I hear the points about democracy. Um, one thing I think we can be very clear on is that we don't want the lawyer to interact unless there's some <coughs> vitally compelling right. reason for them. That if they have concerns about anything, they should address them after the fact, um, going through appropriate channels. Right. I agree. I mean, and basically, if we don't ask him a direct question. Um, unless, as you say, there's a direct, you know, he, there's, a, there's an alarm going off that we need, that he wants to, to alert us to, that we won't, he won't interject, so. Ready to vote? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Uh, aye. Aye. Uh, next is resolution 2015-07, approving preliminary consent for ODOT project. Okay, this was actually sent by <coughs> uh, the county. So it's pro forma, following resolutions enacted by the Village of Yellow Springs, Green County, Ohio, here and after referred to as a local public agency, LPA, in the manner of the state's described project, which one project description. Whereas the LPA slash state has identified the need for the described project, which is performed pavement rehabilitation, which is asphalt overlay, on a portion of State Route 343 in the Village of Yellow Springs from US 68, the Eastern Corporation limit, now therefore be it our new event village of Yellow Spring, Ohio, and then there's the consent statement being in the public interest. The LPA gives consent to the Director of Transportation to complete the above described project. Section 3, cooperation statement. The LPA shall cooperate with the Director of Transportation in the above described, described project as follows. The state shall assume and bear 100% of all costs of the improvement. The LPA agrees to pay 100% of the cost of those features requested by the LPA which are determined by the State and Federal Highway Administration to be unnecessary for the project. Section 4, Utilities and Right-of-Way Statement. No additional right-of-way or utility relocation is required for the project. Section 5, Maintenance. Upon completion of the project, and unless otherwise agreed, the State LPA shall, one, provide adequate maintenance 
for the project in accordance with all applicable, applicable state and federal law, including but not limited to Title 23 U.S.C. Section 116. Two, provide ample financial provisions as necessary for the maintenance of the project. Three, maintain the right of way, keeping it free of obstructions. And four, holds it right away in violent for public purposes. Section Six, authority to sign. Village manager of City Yellow Springs is hereby empowered on behalf of the village of Yellow Springs to enter into contracts with the director of transportation necessary to complete the above described project. Um, and they declare the resolution an emergency measure, but we don't really need that. Well, sure. Can I have a motion, please? So moved. <coughs> Second. Patty, could you explain this one? Um, essentially, ODOT wants to repave the 211 feet that goes from State Route 68 to the Village Corporation limit, and they have to have our permission to do it. I assume they're they're actually going to be repaving all of it? Yes. But we, just, yeah. we just need to give them the consent. So do we know when that project is going to happen? Um, we do not. Um, so that would be good to know. Um, and is this, boy, this must be the first time in eight years or whatever that this has been done, because I've never seen this legislation before, this kind of legislation before. Well, yeah, and obviously they're not doing Route 68 because they didn't send us that legislation. Okay. So um, they're just doing 343 right now. Okay. So, so um, just, I'm sorry, does this go, does this mean it goes out into the intersection of 68 or um, 343? No, I would, no, they probably won't do okay. it. They'll see it somewhere on the apron on the 343 side. Okay. Any other comments or questions? Citizens, comments or questions? Bring it back to council table. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Uh, now is the time in the agenda for um, to hear from citizens about items that are not on the agenda. And um, <coughs> you have three minutes. You need to come up to the front, state your name, and uh, as I said, keep your comments for three minutes. Proceed. <coughs> <coughs> Yeah, hi, uh, Christine Roberts. <clears throat> and I just wanted to bring to your attention this article that came out one week ago in the Dayton uh, Daily News. And it says, uh, two area sites secured to grow marijuana in Ohio. Um, and um, uh, it's uh, the city officials uh, in Moraine. Uh, one of the sites is a Moraine Commerce Park. Uh, and. Uh, there's, there's 10 sites all together, and um, this is all dependent upon marijuana becoming mm -hmm. legal. But this particular group that is pushing these 10 sites, they are proposing all 10 sites are starting with 100,000 square foot buildings. They're building brand new buildings, state of the art, 100 square foot buildings, proposed to triple in size to uh, over 300,000 square foot buildings. They say each, each um, each facility will start with a 130 jobs, but will expand to 250 jobs. It's pie in the sky, yes, but this is what they're planning. Um, uh, there are some of uh, these places where originally uh, these, a lot of these towns didn't know what they were getting into when they began these discussions. Uh, the facilities were, uh, they were just told that they were offering a new product in Ohio. They were described as uh, light manufacturing and assembly. And um, eventually it came out that they were, I know you got to laugh, but this is funny. But we already have a brewery, let's face it. And the brewery is doing well. And uh, this, these, this particular group, which they call themselves Responsible Ohio, they are in favor of the legalization of marijuana but it's going to have whatever marijuana is sold in Ohio has to be grown in Ohio. And uh, there are some sites that are not real happy about it. Uh, the elected officials in uh, Middletown are all against it. And uh, the, um, let's see, the Butler County Sheriff said he'll fight it. So Marines uh, what, already said no. Pardon? Marines already said no. Well, here we go. If what I'm asking of the council and of our uh, village manager that if you're looking for economic <coughs> development we do have a site and um, so uh, if you have some way of contacting these people these reporters have done a very good job of it there's a whole list of uh, uh, contacts here on this page so I can copy this newspaper article and give it I'm sorry I don't have it for, for you right this minute but I can give it tomorrow to Judy and then you can um, share it 
and maybe we will have a new industry in Yellow Springs. All right. Thanks, Thank Christine. You. Okay. Thanks. Any other? Hi, I'm Tom Singh, and um, I wanted to talk about Green Cat. I've been writing that recently um, due to necessity. Oh, sorry. sorry. <laughs> And um, I really, you know, I really love it. You know, the drivers are wonderful, most of them. And um, but it is not the most convenient system. And the attitude from people has been, well, you know, you're lucky to have it. Well, kind of not really, because you get stuck. It's um, I actually happen to have a schedule, and it's kind of Greek. The first time I wrote it, I needed to go to the drugstore in um, Xenia, so I started out. And I missed it. So it took me like 24 hours to figure out how to ride the bus. And by the time I got on it, a girl who was waiting was with me. I'm like, yeah, I've been out at 24 hours trying to, and then I figure out, oh, that drugstore delivers. But anyway, it's, so it's a 90 minute loop. So wherever you want to get on the bus, there's a 90 minute loop. If you get off at Kroger's and you take 10 minutes to get a money gram, you got to wait 90 minutes, unless you want to walk on the highway, you know, and then go to LA Fitness, another 90 minutes. And then the very last stop, it's kind of confusing. Um, it's something around five something. So if you're working in Xenia and you're trying to get back to Yellow Springs and you get off at six, you're screwed. Unless you want to you know, ride a bike on the bike path or walk. Actually last night I got stuck in, um, at LA Fitness, you know, because I got on the bus and you know, the lady said, uh, well, I'm not coming back. You know, this is my last ride, and I thought, oh, well, I'll just ride and go home. And I thought, no, I want to go to LA Fitness. So I went, and I wound up meeting someone who lives in Enon, so they gave me a ride back. But it just, I mean, I don't understand why. And she said, there is a late bus, but that person didn't like to drive in snow, so they weren't going to do it. I mean, I'm willing to do something myself. I'll give you my phone number. Anybody that gets stuck <laughs> riding, you know, cats, call me, and I'll come pick you up. Because it's ridiculous. And it is for, I think, mainly low-income people. You know, I know there's some groups in town that want to ride, and I'm going to do that too. Like have a special day, like Teddy Bear Tuesday, where you get on the bus and have your teddy bear, and just to bring awareness to it that we do use this service and we need it. You know, not everyone has a car, and you can't tell by looking at someone their physical, you know, disability. They may have a bad back, bad feet. They can walk and dance today, but tomorrow they might be flat on their back. So anyway, I just put that out there. I mean, it's a great service. We need to use it and to have it connect to Dayton and. Uh, Springfield, everywhere. Really. Well, I, yeah, there's, uh, I think Eden ha has actually had a service between Springfield to Eden to um, uh, Fairborn. Yeah, there, yeah, and Eden that. is not going to fund it anymore. They're cutting funding. I mean, we can get somebody, I absolutely agree with the fact that the, that the, um, schedule is very difficult to understand. And I, you know, I'd love to get somebody to interpret that schedule. But I mean, I will tell you that. The funding, I, I have a feeling that Green Cats is going to be coming to us in a year or so asking for us to support that program because that that is just a pilot. The, the bus that's coming to Yellow Springs on a regular basis is a three-year project. And they aren't even sure that it's going to be refunded again. Um, so we may not, we may end up not having any bus service I mean, um, I know other than Green Cats, other than the on-demand service that they provide. I did want to mention, um, you know, it does go to Dayton, the red line. Yeah. Pick up. Yeah. Um, but, you, you know, I, I think the key is we've got to get more people to ride it. Right. Bring your teddy bear. Mm -hmm. You have 90 minutes once you get off to kind of party and dance yeah. while you're waiting for the next bus. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else? Okay. Um, Coming back to council table, next we have special reports. We have two reports. First is the Library Commission annual report to council. I see a very um, distinguished librarian oh, sitting there, Excuse or director, or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, members of the council, folks watching at home. I'm Carl Colon, I'm a resident of Yellow Springs, and I have the honor of serving as the director of the Green County Public Library System which includes the Yellow Springs Community Library. Uh, 2014 was a heck of a year. <laughs> um, a very, very uh, wonderful year, very, very busy year. Um, as many folks know, uh, in November, uh, the 
the whole Greene County community voted um, to pass a levy to support the library, uh, stabilize our funding, and uh, let us uh, restore services. I'm happy to share with you, as some of you may have seen in our press release, the library will be expanding our operating hours uh, on March 2nd. Uh, for the guy who had to cut back on the hours when the economy collapsed, i got to tell you, it's a real dream come true to be able to come before this group, uh, especially in the community of Yellow Springs, whose uh, vote was beyond overwhelming in support of, of the library, uh, to be able to tell you that we, we did it, we heard you, and uh, moved as fast as we could. As I uh, shared with Diane out in the hallway, I started drawing up the plans to expand the hours on November 6th, and uh, it's great that we're be able to put that in motion. I thought you might be interested in a few things about uh, Yellow Springs Library specifically. Um, I, I brought the numbers. I try not to be a, a numbers reciter, but I thought you might enjoy them. Uh, there were 112,758 visits to the Yellow Springs Community Library. Uh, 175,747 books went out. Um, 5,604 computer hours used. Uh, 2,637 questions answered. <laughs> uh, 4,043 uses of computers and laptops, uh, looks like. Uh, sorry, my eyes aren't used to be. 459 uses of the meeting room, including 252 uses by community groups. Uh, the programs were off the hook. Let me just give you the big number. The big number is, is that um, 3,531 people came to programs at the library, including my personal favorite program, which was uh, when we had Mariano Rios uh, cooking Argentine barbecue out on the uh, back porch. We'll be doing that again, I promise you. Um, the engagement between the Yellow Springs community and the library is truly something extraordinary. As I've shared with you before, uh, we have almost biblical levels of library use. Uh, and uh, I won't go into the numbers again, I've shared them with you before, but it is truly a joy to be able to serve this community. We're looking forward to a quiet year following last year's epic with the election and all those things. A uh, quiet year of just digging in and serving as best we can. I'm very grateful to the council. I'm very grateful to Patty. Very grateful to Jerry for uh, participating in the library commission. We've been able to sit down uh, just talking with folks, figuring out how we're going to do new things, uh, including a roof, which is going to be a pretty exciting part of 2015 looking forward to seeing that move forward and we're very grateful to the council and the community for the reinvestment in the building that makes the library's partnership with the community possible um, and with that being said uh, again thank you it is uh, it's I'm glad to be a resident of the village glad to be raising my kids here glad to be serving you as your librarian are there any questions I can answer for you could you tell us who's on the library commission well let's see uh, quit Lori Gravely, Lee Duncan, uh, Vicki Eshelman. Um, Jerry is a representative for council. Patty uh, and Connie Hollett and I are the ex officio okay. members. We are not voting members. Um, all that is established actually by the ordinance of council, which long ago had the foresight to say, hey, let's have a formal body where we really sit down and talk things through. Uh, and it's been through the auspices actually of that group that uh, the Village chose to develop a long-term maintenance and care program for the building, which has really been fabulous. Uh, phase one was implemented a couple of years ago, um, making some very important energy efficiency changes to the building. Uh, the roof is the second phase. That's going to be very important. And it provides a talking forum for the village and the library to figure out who does what with the building and how we can move forward cooperatively and, and just make everything as easy as possible for the residents of Yellow Springs. Is Richard's off strong? Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, he's not telling me. Yes, uh, Richard is on there. Thank you very much. <laughs> I wanted to say <laughs> I appreciate that because I won't need it. He's tough. Um, yes, Richard, in fact, is, uh, uh, you know, everybody, I think everybody at the table knows Richard. Okay. Any other questions, Council? Thank you. Thank you yeah, so thank much, you so Carl. Much. Good job. Uh, next, we have the Human Relations Commission Annual Report to Council. Nick? <coughs> hi, hi there. Um, we have had a pretty good year last year, 2014. We had a lot of uh, big changes. Um, mostly, most of everybody on our account commission has changed. So we've been working with a new grouping of people, and we've taken on um, uh, different projects throughout the year. Like in our annual report, you'll see that we were uh, asked to do the uh, police uh, forum. 
Uh, at first it was what you meet and greet with the police chief, but when he retired, and then we had to wait for the new police chief to come in, so we had a meet and greet to ask the community what they wanted, the new police chief, that kind of deal. Uh, and that ended up being a very uh, positive meeting that we had, so it, it kind of um, got the community together and meeting everybody. Uh, other projects that we work on, uh, which was the uh, YS uh, uh, community basketball, something that, you know, when I heard about what happened with them, um, somehow a lot of their equipment went out the door, so we were able to help them out with some funding um, to help get new pennies and new basketballs and that kind of thing. Um, so, um, from what I've learned as being uh, my recent position now, is I'm the chair of the uh, Human Relations Commission because our other co-chair had to step down to take care of our family members. So it, it's basically, um, we had a retreat a few months ago and uh, we actually went over our charter, went over what each one of us' roles are, so <coughs> able to say, okay, you're this person, this is what you do, and we're able to facilitate things. Um, one of the things that uh, is really helpful for me and one of my, I guess, diversity type problems is uh, I have short-term memory loss. So with the help of Brian and liaison, with helping with, uh, uh, sometimes it just helps trigger my memories for different things. So I know. <laughs> um, but uh, what we found is uh, a lot of a lot of projects that we help out with for funding wise. Um, a lot of people didn't know that we were available for it. So a few weeks ago, we had an actual meet and greet with the public to have them come in and meet the HRC group so they can you know, ask questions and kind of told them what we were about and how to do things and projects that we've done in the past and how we can help them out in the future. And it turned into um, a very positive thing because people are realizing that, um, yes, the HRC can come to us for funding to help with various <coughs> things, but also if we can help you with funding-wise, we can also help out with um, um, getting the word out, uh, trying to facilitate people that can help in the various projects, like uh, one of the newer ones was mentioned earlier, and um, with the Marriage Matters, that's something that we're gonna help <coughs> facilitate and help out with. So it's not something that we're going to be uh, funding that I know of for right now, but it is something that we're going to be helping out with and then spreading the word to the community and getting it out there. So. Are there any questions about anything well, new that's going Well, the on? annual report is very impressive, I think, with all the projects. Yeah. Mm -hmm. could, could you go through the list of HRC numbers? Um, I know I keep asking that. Am I putting everybody on the spot? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I, right now, um, there's myself, um, there's uh, Corey Johnson, uh, there's uh, uh, Chrissy Cruz, who's our treasurer. She's in the back of the room right now. Um, there's uh, Steve McQueen. He's recently uh, came aboard and he's our secretary. Uh, we just recently um, elected him now, uh, Aaron Sari. As an alternate. As an alternate. <laughs> and then there's uh, Kate. Kate. Kate Hamilton. Yeah. Catherine Hitchcock. I mean, kind of not to mix up their last names. Right. <laughs> yeah, no, there's a Kate and a Catherine. And then, um, you mentioned Deborah Williamson. Yeah, Deborah Williamson, who was a co chair, but just stepped down from the co chair position because she, uh, her parents, those are uh, ailments going on, so she, she uh, doesn't want to take on the responsibility. So she just, she's going to still be a member and still take part in things, but not, doesn't want to be an elected official type. Thank you. Any other questions from council? Yeah, I just want to say I really thank all the HRC members for going above and beyond. It's amazing how much work we do and uh, it's not uncommon to have, besides our monthly meeting, two or three additional meetings per month. So, uh, so thanks Nick and thanks everyone else for all the hard work. I think it's really paying off. Thank you very much. Good job, guys. Okay. Uh, you know, in the in the future, it might be good if we. I don't. Have we ever specified what should be in an annual? I mean, it would always be good to have the members. To have all the members listed, especially yeah. because sometimes they change over the course of the year. So everybody who served, just make sure all their names are listed so that we can acknowledge them. Yep, that's a great idea. <coughs> um, now we're moving on to old business. Um, 
First, we've got draft commission's ordinance and discussion. That's something that uh, Marianne and Brian have been working on, and we have uh, in our packet. <coughs> so I'll turn it over to whichever of you wishes to speak. So should we talk about roles and responsibilities first? Okay. Um, so um, we have two pieces to this so far. There may be probably. Um, so the first piece was uh, entitled uh, Phyllis Springs Village Council Commission Board Member Roles and Responsibilities. And this has come to council in the past. And one thing that was added was um, to, ha to make sure that commission members uh, took the online course for the Sunshine Law. I think that was the only thing that was added. Right, that was Lori's recommendation. Yeah. And then we, uh, you can see this is the, what, fifth bullet. Um, so it does mention submit the certificate of completion to Judy to keep on record. So um, I have a couple things that I'd like to bring up about about this, this document. First, first of all, the um, Environmental Commission has not really, we, we I, they've seen this but we haven't had a chance to talk about it because we are meeting that <coughs> way late. So um, our, Brian and my goal was to have all the commissions actually be able to look at this and have input into it before it came back for council to vote on it. So I guess I'm not asked, I would prefer the council not vote on that until all the commissions have. But I, I wanted to point out a couple things in regard to this document. The first is in the first paragraph where it talks about why we have commissions. <coughs> and um, the last two sentences, I'm just going to read. These groups function as advisory bodies, and council may request that a commission work on a particular project. The next sentence says, a commission may also make recommendations to council regarding particular issues. Um, I, I think that um, there's a um, a place for council to talk about this a little bit more, and the commissions. A and I know that the two commissions that I have, the Environmental Commission and the Energy Board, have both been promoting projects that um, ha council sometimes has felt like, well, this is coming on too fast, or things like that. So to me, um, I s clearly there's a role for council to make requests to commission. I also see a role of commissions coming to council, um, advising council about particular things, and also um, given that our commissions have a lot of expertise on them. I mean, both the Energy Board and the Environmental Commission have amazing expertise. So I think that it behooves council to really be take seriously if a commissioner board comes to council with a, with a recommendation. And yet, I understand, I can see how things can go both ways. So I just, and I think it was Judy uh, had made a suggestion that we spend a little time working on the process of how a commission comes to council. So I don't know that we want to do that right now, but and maybe that's something we would want to talk about at our retreat. I think so. Might as well add it to another retreat <laughs> agenda. Okay. Um, so that's one point. The second point is the last bullet that we have here, and it says that commission members must rep sh shall represent the village government in a respectful, responsible, and professional manner to the public, even when disagreeing with a particular council decision or action by village staff. Now, um, clearly, this uh, is sort of in the eye of the beholder to some extent. I mean, I think there are some things that everyone could agree are, so, would not be respectful. But then there's probably a gray area. And so I think that this is something that, uh, especially maybe at the commission level, there should be more discussion. What does what does this mean? And really look at some examples. I mean, any kind of um, personal disparaging remark.
for me is disrespectful. That would that would anyone any commission <coughs> person who would say a disparaging remark about anyone on council or village staff uh, or or really anyone in the community in their role as a commission member that would be disrespectful and of course and, and I also feel like you know if we're going to be holding commission people to these kind of standards we have to also be willing to hold ourselves to that so I'm not asking for um, black you know I, I'm just saying I see these are the two areas in this that I think we want to spend a lot of time in our rules our uh, council policies and procedures we have a substantially similar statement about ourselves and uh, our I, have, I haven't seen that haven't yeah we did we discussed it we voted on it when you and Brian were first elected we probably did it in January yes. we don't do it every year we do it for every new council coming okay. in well my thought is also that since we are commission members we would be signing this document I mean we I mean we're not just council liaisons we are part of commissions we vote so if that's going to be the same but we also we also swear in we're also sworn in and as Lori says we are bound by we we vote on and agree to council rules and procedures that are much more stringent and and much more precise than this so I think we're covered and I you know I I personally don't have a problem signing it I'm not on a commission directly a commission that would be required to sign it but I mean I would agree with you that there shouldn't be anything here that council shouldn't agree right. to um, bye bye yeah. so I wanted to add a few more things that I've heard um, one of them so my three commissions have uh, all reviewed it we've talked about it meetings and uh, overall um, everyone thought it was a good document one thing that came up was whether there should be a specific statement such as if you miss three meetings in a row you're removed from the commission so I just that wanna... should be in the commission charter I think that should be in the legislation okay I, I, I think it and is I think it is we, we do have to exercise it. I, I think it's not it's not in any of the ordinance up is I've reviewed uh, for our commissions but I just want to we don't have to decide that now I just want to mention it and the second thing um, was a pretty lengthy conversation about that last bullet and the discussion was that uh, <coughs> commission members felt that it was too subjective and one suggestion was wording it in the negative things that you should not do so again I just want to share those were the two pieces of feedback uh, that came up um, but overall uh, most of my commission members <coughs> understood this doc document thought it looked good I will mention that uh, for folks that don't know it uh, Joe Judy also included the uh, public service <coughs> for local elected officials in our packet this is a document that our commission members get. It's the sort of <coughs> oval diagram with boxes. Um, so just as a FYI, this is part of what commission members get in their packet. Wait, that wasn't in the packet. What are you talking about? It's like that. Fair. Uh, okay. It's a bit <coughs> yeah, sorry. So it talks about fairness, integrity responsibility uh, yes it's got like little <coughs> bullets on the page kind of thing um so that's currently going to new members yes mm -hmm. oh yeah. really okay good um <coughs> what is there I, I believe we also heard from a bca member who said bca is kind of a different animal mm -hmm. um it's not a not a really an extension of council so much as kind of a judiciary body that can check council and so the planning commission is a little bit different too they're the yeah. only two that are set aside by, <coughs> by law yeah um, so they are a little bit different that doesn't mean you can't ask them to right adhere to the same mm -hmm. I mean they are still they appointed are. by council yeah, they um, are. yeah so we might want a statement or something that just indicates that I don't know because it says these groups function as advisory bodies right. and council may request that a commission 
Well, that is a how. That does not apply. <coughs> it's no. Okay. It does still apply, I think, to planning. There's in, a, a function of planning that's advisory. In certain ways it does, certain ways it does not. Right. For a text amendment or a map amendment or any type of comments <coughs> update, that's an advisory recommendation to council. Right. But for a conditional use or a level B site plan review, that's a final approval. Right. Or if it's appealed, then it gets appealed to council for decision to so, so do we have two documents? I mean, could could you maybe, based upon you, you're really in charge of both of those, could you maybe draft alternate language that those members would yeah, sign? Yeah, just kind of a slightly like different version of this. I mean, I, that would be I also wonder if it just topics. says these groups can function I mean that you know making it one of their roles, but whatever. I think I, I would prefer John. Um, well, one of the things I've been working on was to try to update and implement bylaws for both commissions and the board of mm -hmm. the So we would have some firm guidelines to, to rule those, those bodies. And I would say that it's possible that some of this um, trying to trying to um, um, normalize or trying to, to <coughs> get the, the language of the ordinances. Um, yeah. to match probably wouldn't work for BZA and planning. I, I agree that that's a different exercise, but you know, as far as things like doing the sunshine law training, yeah. being okay. respectful, yeah. right. I, I think, you know, I, I think those things need to be apply to everybody. Yeah, yeah. I, I would say this with a little tweaking. Yeah. Mm -hmm. John, John, I agree. I think we can, it'll, it'll be good. I do, th you might want to look at the, we we have actually talked about effectively that last bullet when we did our policy manual. We may not we not we may not have spent much time on it on our last review of it when you guys first came on, but I know we did it maybe the time before. Yeah, so I'll, I'll look at it again. So look at, look at that language and see mm -hmm. see if it if it addresses that sort of idea of maybe going negative as opposed to okay. positive statements. Okay. So then it sounds like. Uh, maybe we'll talk about this at our March 2nd meeting. I mean, I, I feel like you know, there's, there's a, you know, we made a lot of progress. There's not maybe much more to do except talk to our commission members and, and see where we're at. Um, but I do think the other document's gonna take a little bit more time. So you're talking about the, the actual The rules of responsibility. <coughs> oh yeah, now the ordinance. If we can I mean, are, do that. has anything changed on that? I mean, is this a, or is this just in here for reference? The or board and commission the legislation. Sure. Yeah, that's new. This is all new? Okay. Yeah, so what we did was we kind of looked at, um, and so maybe context, there's a couple possibilities, actually three that I can think of. One is that every board and commission would have the standard language and then we would add in the um, specifics about the mission or purpose and Marianne um, when she and I talked I don't need to speak for you but you can uh, add on thought that that might be good because it does then um, remind every commission you know some of the things that are going to apply across the board We've talked also about a general ordinance that has these standardized pieces. And the third idea would be to put it into the uh, charter. I think that last idea is probably uh, difficult. Um, so I'm not recommending that. Uh, so what we did was essentially take all the existing language that's in the ordinances and pull out all the pieces that seemed like they were good because if you look at those ordinances closely, they all have you know, a part here, a part there that makes sense to put for everybody, all right? Some of those include community access panel is one of two commissions where it says, create your rules and procedures that you know, will make sense for operating your commission. <coughs> Most of the other commissions and boards don't have that. Um, so this document then, if you look beyond the establishment and purpose, which would need to be customized to the particular commission, basically proposes what seem to be most consistent about the other pieces, membership, procedures, and that sort of thing. So that's kind of the rough overview. Yeah, I think there are some things that should be pointed out, though, that are a little bit different. Um, uh, 
uh, number C, up to two members can be at large members if there are no qualified village resident candidates or there are other compelling reasons in line with the purpose of the commission or board. So that's a little bit new. So that's saying that um, like if it were the environmental commission and um, for some reason we couldn't find village candidates and maybe we didn't have someone who lived in Miami Township or someone who worked in the village, but there was someone in Dayton who we really wanted that we'd be able to get. So that, that, that is a new thing. But it does, it's generalized, but it, it basically accommodated what we allowed for the Environmental Commission, mm -hmm. um, but generalized it to at large. The Public Art Commission also has this language. Are, are you planning on providing any sort of qualifications or requirements for commissions? If we're gonna, if we're gonna start getting, well, yeah, I mean, I mean we have, okay. I mean, there is the language that says that they have to have education, background, or our background, basically, in whatever the area is. And is that, in, that's maintained in here? Um, I think it's an it's individual. It, it, yeah, it's process. not, it's, no, it isn't individual. I don't think. Is it so, but uh, I mean, wouldn't D. that be, wouldn't that need to be? Because isn't the idea that this is basically going to be the ordinance for everyone with establishment and purpose changing right. and that's yes, everything else problem. is the same? Possibly, if that's the way we go. So it's it's in D. Uh, we just generalized it. Some okay. of the uh, ordinances do go very deep. So, you know, if we feel that that's necessary, but to me, experience, expertise, education. I mean, I, I'm not, you know, we've got each particular commission. I don't know how deep we have to go right, and, no, that's and how fine. restrictive that's we want to be. Um, so yeah, so, and so some of this again was generalizing things that, you know, environmental commission was <coughs> really particular. Um, the library commission is very particular about, you have this person and this person and this person and so, um, maybe it's a little bit easier uh, for a variety of reasons as well, getting people on commissions to, to broaden it. Is there any requirement for a minimum number before a commission is actually functional? So yeah. we five, five to seven members. What, what if there aren't five members? <coughs> what if there are two non-village residents and let's say there's two village residents? That's, and I think that's the problem. Oh. I mean, I think that there always has to be a majority of the residents in a commission. Okay. That might, that might be difficult to, to word that. I mean, if you have... Well, I would of course, if you have a council rent. person and two villagers, that's three people. Right, but I'm just saying, it, what if somebody think, drops off? Yeah, I think at the C you have to just say however. Okay. It must be. Just, it, it really just nails it home. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Um, now I know um, that, is, is it also new that no appointed member shall serve more than two full consecutive yes. terms? Yes, that's new as well. Term limit. So it used to, some of them used to say three. Mm -hmm. And, and so, it was my feeling that having someone on a board or commission for nine years is sort of over the top. I think it's important to be bringing new people in and having someone be on for that period of time, I think it's unnecessary. I think one of the things that commissions serve is to be able to bring new people in, to let new people have that opportunity to grow in expertise. And so that it was my suggestion. I actually, I think it's a good standard practice. And this does mean, of course, that if somebody takes a break, they can come back, because it does say two consecutive. Right. Um, but yeah, Marianne and I agreed that was something we, we should talk about, you know, and, and how did we feel. And uh, it, at least one commission member uh, suggested that it could make it difficult, um, just in terms of keeping members on commissions. Um, but honestly, with the exception of one commission, I haven't noticed that to be the case, uh, at least recently. I mean, I think that... Well, I think, I don't, if, if it was, <laughs> I don't remember what planning commissions is, but I think um, 
we kind of lost a lot of people all at once and mm -hmm. actually having term limits can help make sure that you you're not bringing in a whole bunch of people who have been you're losing a lot of institutional memory all at once mm -hmm. um, it's really better if it's more kind of a washing in where right. people gradually so so I think there's some real benefits to having having uh, a little bit of term limitation. Um, in the, uh, I have, I have a little bit of problem with the second sentence. It says the members of the commission board shall be as broadly representative of the residents of the village as possible. I mean, I guess that depends on how that gets interpreted. On HRC, that makes sense. On the energy board, I think we want people to have that kind of expertise, so it's not really that broadly representative. So. Yeah, but it would be, you know, I mean, especially on things like <coughs> that are going to affect people's budgets, um, it would be good to have low-income people at the table saying, you know, remind, making sure that, so I, I, I think there's good reasons even with Energy Board saying, well, wait, how is that going to affect my electrical bill? hard for me to pay my electrical bill. Nobody's at the table saying that. Um, that you don't necessarily have to have expertise in order to say, to be asking the questions that should be asked early on. So are you saying that um, you, do you think that trumps having expertise? That, that, that we should in no, our I, I think uh, there's no There's no suggestion of trumping here. It's just mm -hmm. saying that's what it, it that's a that's a goal as an ideal that that people should bear in mind if they're putting okay. people. We're we're supposed to be representing the citizenry, not a particular perspective of the citizenry. We have broad perspectives in the community, and I think the commissions should represent those perspectives. Um, e is new. Uh, we decided that it would make sense to uh, codify the officers and also explain what they do. Um, and it says council liaison can serve as an officer. Now, that, is, that would be a slight change to our past practice. Yeah, I, I think currently it's it's unstated. So it's, it's kind of gone, you know, with new commissions, we've had that situation where they, you know, we've had a chair I think in more established commissions, we've avoided that. Um, and we, get, again, decided to put it in there um, because we probably need to talk about it. When you say new commissions? I guess revived. So like, I, I think of the Public Art Commission was relatively new because it had only had one meeting. Mm -hmm. And so I have effectively served as the chair until two meetings ago when we elected a chair, so <coughs> in one year and then reviving the Environmental Commission. Uh, we agreed that Marianne made sense to be the chair for that. Right. So, right. Yeah. Yeah. But I think putting that in there, you're not saying for a year. I mean, I, I at least expressed a, a desire that council members not yeah. be yeah, I chair, think, not be officers. I, I, I would like it worded differently, too. Right. The, I would like it worded kind of the Qualified. opposite way, more like, Ideally, the council liaison will not serve as chair um, unless accepted or as any officer. Um, okay. Something along those lines, so that, it, so that there might be circumstances where the where the council liaison would, but that that wouldn't be our standard practice. What what is the concern that you have? What are the, your concerns about having a council person be? The, my concern is that the council person could conceivably be leading the meeting and leading the, the commission toward objectives that they have that may not be <coughs> the, the commission's uh, objectives, but being that the council members, the chair, the rest of the committee members would probably be reluctant to want to challenge the chair of being at the chair as a council member. Okay. And, uh, and, and, and and to me, the, the idea of setting up the commission, the commission was, was to bring in members of the community so that they could 
help advise council and work with council and me as a council liaison will be there to make sure that they're not stepping out of the bounds of their charter or if there is an issue that we're not sure of as the council liaison I, I would do that if it requires a legal opinion or maybe the other council members want to weigh in it that would be my role but you know to my idea was is that i want to get as much out of those commission members because they may and will probably see things a little bit different because again i would have to come back to council to make that recommendation and <laughs> and I, it didn't happen but I always think about the group agrees and I'm in there and agree I come to the council table and vote no <laughs> you know, after I hear all the discussion from the you other know, council members and so forth so I I, um, I just think that uh, at least I found it the commissions that I'm not being the chair, I see a lot of interaction within the group. Since I haven't been on one where a council member is chair, I don't know what that interaction is or, or if it's being influenced. So that's just my opinion. John, for planning commissions, is this um, a fair standard practice in the, in the, in the field? That because that, that was kind of my impression, but I, I like it when you ask this question, because it's like, well, why do we do it that way? Why is that the way it's or, been? Or, or not having the council person who's serving on the planning commission be the chair of the planning commission? Uh, for a planning commission, typically the council person does not serve as chair or vice chair in that situation. Do you know what the, what is the rationale? But because it would, it would be kind of Jerry's point about controlling the agenda um, kind of using it as your little place your, to push. For example, and if it's different, um, the the role, main role of the planning commission is, is for legislative function. So mm -hmm. you would basically be uh, bringing stuff, your own thing to, to council eventually. Right. So even though you can you're, you sit on the commission and you vote on the commission, uh, your role your person is a little bit different. Well, and, and there are also instances where council can overrule planning commission on procedural errors. Exactly. So, so, so it's best for it's that reason not to have, right. I think that was the, the commission I was particularly thinking about. And I think there is a sense that, um, especially if you have a very divided council, that a council member could kind of use a commission or board and kind of be pushing a particular angle. It, so it just feels, it does feel a little bit more democratic to have it, to just have that pop, that little bit of tiny bit of power decentralized a little bit, and maybe especially with a, with a quasi or legislative judiciary body like a planning commission. It feels better to not have the, the council person being the one. And one citizen had commented that it, it's sort of akin to double dipping in right. some way. So, um, yeah, so I, I mean, I think it's, it's definitely worth looking at. Um, I will give one other scenario because Marianne and I talked about this a lot, which is um, Nick mentioned the uh, large turnover with HRC. So we had a period of five months where we did not have a chair or vice chair. So somebody needed to jump in. And so in that case, I, you know, help that consistency until we have that established, so. You know, I also have a concern for what expectations of council members and the amount of time council members can spend serving. And we already do spend, with our normal duties, spend an awful lot of time serving. And to put the onus of, of potentially chairing other commissions on top of it, I think, and the work that goes along with that, as evidenced by these kind of reports that Brian's putting together, is um, I think I think it's I, I just think it, it puts this expectation of council members essentially working full time as council members, and um, I don't think that um, I think that 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 actually is it's difficult. I think it's 
it's just an unrealistic expectation. Um, I, I guess I'll, I, I'm listening to what you're saying, and I don't, for the most part, disagree. I do see a different role for a chair, um, not so much as power, uh, more as coordinating. So if, if we have uh, people on a commission who say work full time and have a lot of expertise, but there's no one who has the time to be doing the kind of things to coordinate what's going on, that sort of allows the people with their expertise to put their expertise in and not have to be thinking about the overall thing. So that, that for me, that's a different way of looking at the role of chair as opposed to the person who can get what they want done. Um, but I think so you, I, you two are also <coughs> speaking as retired, or as people that don't have full-time jobs. And yeah. I think that that does make a difference. So I, well, I mean, I'm I think just saying we, I would word it differently. Yeah, I would yeah, not, I think I would we not can do that. It, the possibility, but I would word it so that it's clear that it we don't. It's not ideal. Yeah. Um, okay. And there have been times, probably at every commission, where it just the, the person who was in the position that could do it for some period of time turned out to be the council person. But that isn't the ideal. We don't want that to be the become standard practice. How about if you just add the wording, except in unusual circumstances? Something like that. Yeah. Right. A council member shall not serve as an officer. Yeah. Something like that. Yeah. But, but also on, on the other side of it, as we're, we're out soliciting members to commission, we need to explain all the variables that, that go along with it. Because if, if we say that the commission shall have a chair, a vice chair, and a secretary, and if you have a commission of only five, then, you know. We're probably going to be doing one of those roles. You know, right. And, 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 and if, if, if they don't, if you find that the whole group does not want to perform those roles, then we have to sit back and take a look at how we ask them too much of those folks on the commission were not want to accept those roles. And, and like John, me and John were kind of talking um, about planning. And uh, <coughs> here, uh, a, a member could be sued. Right? And, and if someone may back up and look at one of the others, if I do and I recommend something, it could not be sued. So the, the things to think about as you approach folks to, uh, to ask them to serve. Right? I mean, finding a secretary is a big challenge. Mm -hmm. We don't have a secretary for community access. Um, we have a, uh, no, for a while, planning so. commission won't need one because we're, we really have to have mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. clerk there. Mm -hmm. um, so we again, some of this language won't work for mm -hmm. certain mm -hmm. I know that, are we going to go through this whole thing? I know that Sue has a comment and you know, maybe other I citizens have comments. Sue? Yeah, I'm sorry, I was Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, I would like to remind council of some things which you've touched on, but I, I have to say not with the emphasis that I, an ordinary citizen, would like to see. And that is, you five are the people elected to represent the citizens. Commission members aren't chosen by the people. And so the representation of the citizenry that they may be able to provide is pretty diluted, if it exists at all. And so when you're looking to a commission of people who, who you then are hearing as speaking from the community, I think you're leading the citizens to understand something that is really fair because we don't have any choice in who serves on your commissions. You pick them, not us. We don't even have any role in what those commissions do other than if we can attend their meetings and hope to have an opportunity to speak to the, the agenda, which does and does not always happen. That's part of my concern 
And my other part of the concern is that commission members often seek places on the commissions because they have a very strong interest in a particular path. And that strong interest can very carefully, uh, can, can very clearly um, create emphasis for that path that that is re reflection of their views, not anybody else's. They don't represent anybody but themselves. So council has a real responsibility to make sure that you're keeping a good understanding and an intellectually honest appreciation for what the, the commissions you appoint can offer you and should not offer you and make that kind of understanding as clear as possible to the commission members because they also cannot speak for you not as i understand it legally and the village citizen needs to understand who is speaking when issues are being discussed and how did those issues how did those conclusions being reached come about it's very difficult for a citizen to know what goes on in the various sundry commission meetings. It's, you talk about the amount of time for each of you. Think about the amount of time for a citizen to attend how many? Seven different commissions plus council meetings? These are things I'd like you to consider as you go forward. I'd like to, to be assured that you understand your responsibilities and the commission members that you hire, hire understand their responsibilities and limitations. It's only fair. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Chrissy? Hi, I'm Chrissy Curtis. I just wanted to talk about the part about the uh, council member being chair of the commission. Just from my experience, when um, I got an HRC, it was three new people, me, Kate, and Catherine at the same time, and the commission apparently had been not very well attended for a while, and so Brian was the chair. Basically, we didn't have a chair, so it was kind of the chair. Um, and being new to commissions, I, I didn't think there was anything wrong with that. It seemed to be fine to me. But then as we went along the first few meetings, I noticed, it, and it's, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with it, but because Brian is on council, when there is an issue, everybody kind of looks over to the council person, and his point of view is going to hold more weight. I just saw it automatically happening because it's the council person. So you automatically kind of think, well, we should go along. He knows more about it than we do. And really, I think that's probably not a good thing to have on the commissions. I mean, I, it's important to have council member there, and I, I like the idea of the council member giving input. But as far as having a council person the chair, um, it just, it, for that reason, it just doesn't seem like a good idea because it seems like the commission, now we work together better that we're all using our separate voices. The commission is more. Our discussions are more well-rounded, more lively, and I don't see everybody just stopping and looking over and saying, okay, so what should we do now, Brian? It's like we're good. Um, so I, I just wanted to speak to that. I don't think it's a, a good idea to have council member be the chair. Thanks, Chrissy. Any other comments? <coughs> so I think, you know, I think we've given you a lot of input. You guys still have a lot. <laughs> you know, I think maybe trying to figure out where planning, you know, how planning, and maybe the other the thing to do is just pull out planning and BZA for, and for just this, say. Yeah, for this, that's really what we were thinking. I mean, again, roles and responsibilities, I think it should apply to all commissions. Um, but worded but this, differently that John's going to work on. Right, but this, I, I, I don't think we were thinking about BZA and planning commission when we did this. Um, I do want to mention one other thing that's new, which is A, uh, we did, Codify our process because we've you know talked a lot about or recommending to codify it. We talked a lot of we've talked a lot about you know we're supposed to be interviewed by two council members, but 
I've never seen that written anywhere. So I, I thought it was important that we did have that in writing. So, um, and I wonder if we should actually, <coughs> when we do a vote, we do a motion and a vote. I wonder if there should is there be legislation actually appointed. Hmm. I mean, that, look at maybe look into that. No, you don't think so. Oh, no. Oh, yeah. 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 Okay. Okay, so I guess the question that I would have is, is this ready to get feedback from commission members like we did with roles and responsibilities? If we, because I guess there are <coughs> three things we were tweaking, <coughs> or not. Because it does take a while to get that review. And it seems fine to me. Are you gonna, are you gonna go ahead and tweak yeah. those things and bring it back to council or how are you going to well the, the way we did it the last time was I, I took Lori's recommendation about the sunshine law and added that in and then we sent it out um, and so uh, I mean so we were going to tweak um, the uh, chair yeah so the chair right um, um, about the majority of uh, right. people on a commission being village residents yep Actually, maybe it's just two things then. So. Do you want to say, I wonder, I mean, and I, to Jerry's point about, you know, the fact that you may have a five person commission and you may have four officers, um, is, you know, I, I just wonder if a vice chair is. Make that an option or something? An option or. Yeah, it doesn't have to be the person who. Well, I just wonder if the vice chair could be the secretary. Although they can't run the meeting and taking notes. meeting and taking notes. I mean, I guess the purpose of the vice chair is just an absence. Right, because yeah. otherwise, again, that's a scenario we were in at the HRC. I always think of a kind of a leadership building. That's the other reason not to have the council person is that mm -hmm. ideally commissions create a place for regular citizens to get involved with government and by, by being a chair that gives you a potential to you're coming to council periodically you're speaking to council um, then if you decided you wanted to run for council it's a it's a way for you to kind of you know see and feel what it's like and for people to start to see you in an, in an active and responsible role and uh, and what I like about the roles and responsibilities because I think it speaks directly to Sue's points for instance the point that you can't represent yourself to the public as having special power as a commission member um, and everything that commission and, and it makes it very clear that everything that commissions do has to come before this body to be publicly heard and vetted. Um, so, uh, so I think it helps, and I think then making the the ordinances for the commissions more consistent also makes it clearer for citizens what the heck might be going on on any of these because it's not a sort of a separate right. weird rules for every every commission so if a citizen wants to say hey something's not being followed here you don't have to memorize 12 different ordinances for our or the different ordinance for every count commission that we have so i would be hopeful that these changes are actually speaking to some of those issues right and, and honestly except for the few things that came up this is all language that's already there mm -hmm. so it really just was what makes sense what doesn't moving that around um, so I would say, yeah, I mean, move okay. forward with. Great. Uh, council goals is next on the agenda. We had something at our table, and I don't remember if it was in the packet or not. Um, yeah. Was okay. Um, so Marianne, I think you were working on that. Yeah. Um, so what what I did is I took the. Um, goals that we had agreed upon or, uh, and put them into the uh, chart that Karen had created. And um, what I'm recommending is that uh, council, that we look at these first five and, and make sure that I got the language the way we want it to be because I'm not sure that I did it do that in terms of how we're saying the goal. And then we decide we agree upon a council person who's going to take the leadership in terms of filling in the values, 
the activities required, the proposed time change, and the resources, and then come back to council with that. And that we do that for all of the goals. Not, not tonight, but that we look at these five goals. Did I capture in the goal statement what we want? Because I don't think, in terms of number three, where I said the budget, I think it got changed to financial accountability or something, and um, I, I didn't, I submitted it before I read the paper, actually. <laughs> I read the paper and I saw that Diane had written what I think uh, Karen had suggested. And I think um, we would be reviewing it. What Melissa says, we effectively need to review it monthly, and I believe that we decided that Jerry would meet with her so that if she can't be at the meeting or um, the, uh, yeah, if there's any questions or whatever. Yeah. Melissa's going to be here quarterly and Jerry's going to handle it the other times unless there's something so, Yeah, something, something big. comes up. Right. And, yeah. and, um, so, and I can talk about that now, but she plans on having some graphs that might be easier to present. Right, that, that, that all those lines of numbers. So, and I still wonder if that's a goal, though. I mean, I think you mentioned that last time, yeah. that it just doesn't, it feels like See, something. Well, we, have, we have to do it now. Basically. Right. Because we got we to gotta approve Right. <laughs> Although we, yeah. yeah. Um, Tech. I mean, to me, if, if we're going to say, if, if we're going to say something about the budget, it's got to be more about. Um, I think you had said something about financial accountability. Fiscal responsibility. Fiscal, yeah, I mean, fiscal, fiscal Yeah, I mean, I think it's got to be more than just reviewing the budget. I mean, it's, it's, and, and I think maybe that ties into number five. It's our financial strategy moving forward, you know, for the long term, and, you know, yeah, that's what we really need. Right. And that, I mean, that to me can be kind of collapsed into activities, and then the review of the budget quarterly, that, goes into activities required. Mm -hmm. How about exercise fiscal responsibility? But I think it's more than that. It's more, I mean, we've got to come up with a strategy. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. because we plan for tax levy. It's really about that, how we're going to move forward fiscally. And so are you suggesting that we put the tax levy within, within that goal of fiscal responsibility? Yes. I mean, so uh, in other actions might be that we cut back on I would, I would, I would develop. make, uh, I think our goal here is to try to have actionable things as opposed to, because we've got the six overarching mm -hmm. um, um, values, principles that we, and one of them is to be financially yes. sustainable. Mm -hmm. So that's a, that's our, that's just like part of our mission, right? Um, what we need is like develop, like, clear strategy towards uh, fiscal sustainability. Um, we, need, we need that. We need to make sure that our, we are meeting, we, we are working towards a budget that is not no red. And we need to figure out strategies to get there. I mean, I think it could be that, that simple. I mean, and then activities are tax levy, monthly, Budget review. Um, um, rate our rate studies. That we're yeah, doing. rate studies. Well, I would I would keep tax levy separate. Though. Really, you would? Okay, I would because that's a that's a, these are actions, right? They're not the overarching. They're like we need a plan for fiscal responsibility. And the tax levy is part of that, but it's not um, it's not the plan. We know that we have to. Then that would be an actionable item under that. Um, I guess it doesn't matter, but it seems separate. like it's too kind of like we need somebody to make sure that that's staying on task, and we need somebody to. I mean, you think it's important. Thinking. You think it's important enough? It sounds like to keep it separate. I, I do. Yeah, I, I kind of agree with too. It should be separate. Well. So my suggestion was that we have one council person that <coughs> really fill, who fills out the activities, the proposed time frame, the resources, and brings it back to council. Mm -hmm. And 
so I would suggest Jerry <laughs> for that. The, I mean, uh, since Jerry, levy, you know, for, for, for a three, for, for three, developing a <coughs> strategy toward, toward or for fiscal responsibility. Or I, I have developed a sustainable financial strategy. Okay. Are you going to come up with something and then I'll Okay, develop a sustainable financial strategy. Because me and Melissa are working in the summer, so. Right. I mean, I don't even have a financial strategy. You just come up with a title. You develop a sustainable budget is really, I mean, financial strategy is almost too no, low. Because we as a group, you have already developed the budget. Yeah, it's a thing. Yeah, that's so a sustainable financial strategy. Yeah, so it's yeah, it could include things like what we're going to talk about about the utilities and our process. For See, and that's what, when, when I met with Melissa for the first time, we should be recognizing things to then bring back to the total council mm -hmm. and say, okay, mm -hmm. now we need to, because we see this, we need to do that. Right. Yeah. I still like the idea, and I, I don't disagree with you, and I guess what it would be, so that if we have a separate thing for the tax levy, that it still is under that, that fiscal value. Yeah. I, want, I want it to be just because I don't, I want people to understand it all goes. Yeah, it all goes under, under pursue a strong mm -hmm. economy. Okay. No, that's, no, there, there's, an ex, there's, well, there's another one, one. You're right. about fiscal responsibility. I don't know what it is. Do we have those for this up somewhere here? Our six. Oh, our six mm -hmm. values. Those are values. They're, no, and I, they're, they're in here in some places, but I didn't put them in for the new. Interesting, we don't have, we don't have that one for any of our other ones. Well, it's just not, it's just not So then what about uh, goal one uh, regarding the water projects? Is, the, is there a council person that would take the responsibility for filling that in? In terms of the values, activities, time frame, and resources, or do we want Patty? I think Patty should do that one. To be honest, don't you? Have that one? You mean just filling in what values this works with? Well, and activities, activities required, the time frame, yeah, the, the and the resources. I think the council people associated with could do the values probably. Right. The values. Yeah. Um, okay, and then then the second one is to uh, create a sustainable economic development strategy to support existing businesses, entrepreneurs, and home occupations that attract new opportunities. And that was really from the last, I just kept that, the wording from the last. Right. I would like to work on fleshing this one out. Because right now we're just talking about fleshing out the goal, right? Yes. Yeah, just putting in like that. Okay. Okay, and then the sidewalk. Decide a strategy for sidewalk repairs and new construction. I think that should be one of the staff members. Well, she's got Jason behind her, and I think that's he's, she has, he's kind of working. She has Jason and myself both down. The council is going to have to make the decision, right? Primary decision on this, which is going to impact. I mean, I think, I think maybe council. Council can do the anticipated results, results potentially, but I think the activities and maybe even the time frame yeah. has to be a little bit. Yeah. That has to be more staff yeah. driven, yeah. and the resources I think are also can be informed by staff more than council. Well, then should you, should we have one council person work with Jason to do? Uh, well, I've been. I mean, I'm just thinking that one council person can do everything. The, can do the left hand, the left hand side, because that's what we're kind of saying is council, and then and work with staff or give it to staff to, to do the right hand answer. side. Yeah. You're, split, you're splitting it in, yeah. anticipating it. Yes. Right. But I, I do see what Mary Ann's saying about some kind of collaboration to make sure that these match up. So even if there is some separate work. Well, yeah, and, right. and I would be, you know, because mm -hmm. uh, the anticipated results. Pretty you know. <laughs> I mean, I can do. If, I mean, if we want to, if we timelines got to be a realistic also. If yeah. we want to break them up into 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 four or five things <coughs> and have each council member work on something, I'll work on the levy, the levy piece. Okay. 
Okay, so we have Jerry with hand number three, Karen with hand number five. And I was, uh, I've been working on them because I've been going around with the Jason looking at sidewalks. Sidewalks? So, so you're I saying can, you would? Yeah, I can, you yeah, know, that's, that's what I think. But to me, the sidewalk, it's going to depend on what decision council makes. Even, even in terms of how much money we spend and how, what the timeline is. So. Right, but council will base that decision on the information that Jason brings based right. on the inventory of the sidewalks and the, right. the projected cost of it. Okay, so, so what I'm showing now is that for the water project, goal number one, Patty is gonna be filling that in. Number two, uh, about the economy, Brian's gonna fill that in. Three, Jerry, four, Jerry, and five, Karen. And can you, can we say that um, we will have these filled in for the next council meeting? Yes. Make sure that we get um, those values reattached to the, yeah, um, maybe on the last, um, you think you can find those. Oh yeah, and then yeah. third resolution. So just it'll just be easier for people to fill them in if they have those the wording right in front of their noses. Yeah. In fact, we might want to get that incorporated into this document. Put it in the header or something. So that it's yeah, that right up at the top. And the first, the first page. Because otherwise, you're. Yeah. Yeah, see, I, I would rather for me with the second. The second meeting in March. In March versus the first. So the sixteenth. And um, I mean, just while we're talking about goals, we talked last time about, you know, when we were thinking about whether there were four or five here, this idea of focusing on, well, we've been doing it, but with the commissions and the relationship between commissions and council. Um, so I guess I would either like one of us to maybe draft how that goal could look, because it's not really here. And we're already accomplishing a lot of the work this year anyway. Um, the so goal for standardizing? Well, I guess, but I guess what sort of Jerry articulated and, you know, that whole sort of how do we work together. So that's part of it. Yeah, I thought we said we were going to talk about that in a retreat. The, you mean the procedure and how how things should flow? Right. Yeah, I thought I, that was at the retreat. But well, isn't all this going to come to the retreat? I mean, is it that... I was actually going to suggest that we flesh this out at the retreat. I mean, I'm assuming that we have a, do we have a retreat? No. Mm -hmm. so. And I don't think we don't have it. We probably, it's, it's in future agenda items, depending on how long we get out of there, I wouldn't mind starting to at least throw some dates out tonight. Um, because we've got to get on it. Yeah. <coughs> we have an attorney. Well, well why don't we try to get this back to these done of the second meeting and get it ready? Filled in. I don't know. I I would say we probably have. Realistically, I don't know if we're going to get all of, all of these. Um, some of them we never really voted on, like the feedback system mm -hmm. or monitoring the state performance of the community. I I think we're yeah, HRC, I think HRC is doing enough. Yeah. Just getting things together. I don't think we're going to get to that. I don't right. know that. You know, collaborate on housing need assessment. Uh, I don't know if that's going to happen this year. Uh, it feels like realistically we can only probably do about the top six or seven. So it sounds like what you're saying is that we should be looking at these secondary goals and decide which ones of them we might be doing some work on this year and which ones we might not be doing it. Yeah, I mean, we can take update council chambers out. That's in Patty's report, it's going to happen. Um, I think we can even take the, you know, we can modify the first one about the website because that's going to be live maybe in two or three months. Um, Use it, it was the best use of 
public owned property. Oh. And that's why I actually think it should be. I'm not sure how it got yeah, yeah. reduced to just yeah. the glass one. <laughs> yeah. oh, we know. <laughs> well, um, Ju that, Judy created the calendar of legislation. So that's already been done. Yeah, here. that's. Yeah. Okay. That was handed so out in January. I think that was, yeah, I think it should I, I be. Was concerned and we that can we even take out. All. We can just say public owned <coughs> property and take out the two. Yeah. Oh, okay. I don't know, involved community and developing a vision for, with goals for village energy use. Um, it sounds like that's kind of the job, the kind of constant job of the energy board. Yeah. Um, so I don't see that as something that council itself is really setting as a goal. We, or we, it is a big overall goal and we've given it kind of to energy board to help us with that. Yeah. Maybe that's another excuse me possibility though that these could be you know we could kind of separate these out by commission yeah because i see this as being because i would hate for it to go up you know but identify it as a commission goal as yeah. opposed to our specific goal because we do have the value that are is that a priority we've identified for 2015 not really no. but we may respond to something i mean that's why we have those value statements that right. are consistent that we should look at every year so right. I definitely want them to pack it next time so we can see if there's any language that needs to be tweaked but those don't change um, those I mean, are consistent for many years on these two pages I mean most of those really are being done by commission so let's just you know pull those out and, and whoever those chairs are or those those liaisons are maybe you can flesh out but I definitely think the one at the top of the page that show me best uses for those public properties given our financial situation, right. we need to do that and it's become much more of a priority that we have to, yeah. we have to look at those assets and think about can those be places where property taxes can come from, more rate payers for our, um, for our, our village owned utilities. And, and maybe that actually no, maybe becomes maybe that becomes or maybe that becomes part of the fiscal sustainability it, 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 sustainable yeah, financial yeah, strategy yeah, maybe, it's yeah. a sub point under it's a yeah. activities required and i don't even know if that's would be the, the, the language maybe examine how right. publicly owned properties <coughs> could be utilized to further our goals. I mean, one yeah. of our, our values, and one of our values is fiscal sustainability. And it's also well, housing. I mean, it's well, also yeah. Right. And, yeah, providing good um, housing in the end. Okay. Are you keeping this one to go? Yes. Okay. Um, Citizen okay. comments, input? <coughs> okay. Um, just, I do want to just follow up. <coughs> We did agree upon the first five. I mean, shall I do anything with the rest of these? I mean, well, or it, I mean, let's, if you, if everybody agrees, identify the ones that are connected to commissions in each four or five of these, you know, the internet cellular, that would be CAP, Parks is PAC. Um, so you're HIC. envisioning kind of like two documents I, I, instead of one? Yeah. I mean, okay. I mean, because I think we do want to, you know, prioritize what commissions or are doing. Or it's something that we could, yeah, two documents. I'd see pretty much all of number page two is effectively, I don't, I think we just crossed all of those off. So now we're down to, and I think we crossed off the last two um, as not being doable this year. Right. Um, so I think we're down to about seven. I mean, the first five on the first eight, I guess first five on the first page and then the top three and one of those may be a sub point yeah, the top one may be yeah, a sub point yeah, three, so yeah so i so i did have seven actually because if if, right. if number three is a sub point i'll go i'm probably more inclined to keep these all like if they're big projects you know separate but they kind of have an edge overlap mm -hmm. So I, I think we're kind of down to seven or eight, depending on how you count. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Reasonable. 
I mean, if, and, and it's fine with me. I mean, if, if, if I'm fine with the ones that are more related to conditions, I'm fine with taking those off of this document. So, and not even having, a, having an attachment or a separate document um, that would identify those as commission goals. If we could do it on a one pager, that would be nice. Okay, unfortunately, they don't have numbers, so when you've been talking about things, I'm not necessarily certain. So maybe okay. I'll get together with We have one more five on our first page. Okay. As far as I can tell, the second page is gone. The second page is, oh, is gone. The, the top three are already done. Either commission right. or they've been done. Right. Yeah, okay. And, and then it's just the top three on the third page. Karen suggests that number that, that determine the best uses for public owned property is part actually a part of our um, financial strategy. Right. Yeah. The fiscal responsibility strategy. Um, so that could potentially go under number three. And then the next two are would be number six and number seven. The next two being the next two being explore strategies for improved internet. And then the next one being expand parks department to provide more support for youth programs. And then you're saying but what I the only yeah, thing I'm not sure about that number seven. The only thing I'd say about those and, and it's kind of this vision of energy use, would we be doing those without the commissions? The con those are work that the commissions would be bringing to us. I doubt if CAP was not working with somebody on this, um, on the internet, on the wireless, and on the, the fiber optics, that that is a project that council would be exploring on our own. So to me, I see that those as really being more commission driven. And the same thing with the parks department. That is probably not something that council would be doing on our own with staff. Those are going to be informed and work that's going to be done yeah, I guess for me, what I was saying with like the, the involved community in developing a vision with goals for energy use, including citizens, businesses, not profit, that's kind of the definition of what Energy Board does. It's not a, an action, it's what they do. Um, what is different about these is that these are actual actions um, <coughs> that are more specific, uh, whether we want to do them but they are more specifically both. We can ask those commissions to do those things, but it's not like kind of the definition of the commission. You know what I mean? It's the definition of the, or a big, of one part of what environmental commission should do would be helping us think about that green space on an ongoing basis. They should be visiting and thinking about how should we be thinking about green space. Um, yeah. That's kind of an ongoing part of what the Environmental Commission has established to do. Um, but deciding, okay, we need to make a decision <coughs> about cellular infrastructure. If that's what we want to do, that seems a little bit more specific than, than like number. But I guess the question would be, do we want, do we even want them? I mean, I understand that they're, that they're actionable, but do we want them on our goals for 2015? I don't yeah, think I, don't I do. Think so no. so no. that's, that's, yeah. you know, and, and then there's other thing, how do we keep things from not getting lost? No. Yeah. And exactly. so I think we can do that by keep sticking things down, you know, saying we're not working on them this year, but we don't want them to get lost. Well, let's try. I mean, and I think we can probably fit this into one front and back page. If you want to, you know, if you want to do have not the have them not numbered, say for you know for future consideration or something like that on the second sheet, mm -hmm. and then take off the ones that, and we won't worry about trying to get everything filled in. Yeah, the ones that are right. more for future consideration. Okay. Um, next is discussion of utility. Oh, I'm sorry, Diane. Go ahead. I think goals are important and strategies are important and, and it feels like the public should weigh in um, and it's been a little frustrating that 
discussions seem to be sort of piecemeal in the goals um, tonight. Maybe there were a few copies on the table, but, it, but there weren't any more when I went out to look. So we weren't following along with you. And, um, so it's been a little confusing. Um, and I have a concern that, that this not be a topic at the retreat, or if it be a topic at the retreat, that it certainly the public needs to be there too. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you. Diane. So can we, um, so we do have this on the agenda, so, we, yeah. so we've decided that this will be on the March 17th, March 16th agenda, and so then if we can make sure we have this complete, and make sure there's plenty of copies, and make sure there are plenty of copies, and it does get out. Yeah, is there a way, um, what's the best way to solicit input, because I think Diane's raising a good point that we want to make sure we're clearly soliciting. Maybe we can write a press release or something on us. And yeah. the, the other thought is, um, you know, a while back we approved the use of Thought Bubble, but when we tried to do it a couple times, uh, there were glitches. So that, you know, there is that application out there that could facilitate this with a press release, um, and so information could be gathered. So, I mean, are the glitch, I assume it was the glitch in the system. I mean, are the glitches fixed? I think so. I, I've been planning to re-engage with Matthew Kirk to see. So, um, but that's why we haven't implemented it yet. So. Well, but obviously people can also just write us letters. Right. So right. I want to do that. They can just write us letters. Yeah. I mean, maybe we can, but maybe we can just write some kind of a, I could write some kind press of a press release, release that indicates what, are, what, what our top priorities yeah. are currently. Oh. Um, we're going to be voting on these. We're going to be uh, looking at them. We've used SurveyMonkey in the past. That's been pretty successful. Um, so I think we could try multiple things. I, 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 I don't. Do. I honestly don't like SurveyMonkey. I mean, I think I, I want to hear. I just want to hear. I want. Hear. I want. I want. I don't want surveys. Do you like this? Yeah. I want input. Not. I want. Well, the way we did it for the local policing forum, it was just fill in the blank. So it was just, it facilitated writing the letter. So my experience is that some people like to be on Facebook, some people like to write an email, some people like to make a phone call, so maybe giving different options is a good you idea. Think you could come up with a survey monkey? Yeah. Okay, all right, I have no, no objection. So but it would just be one question, yeah. and then you just, just type in. Yeah, we'll just start okay. out multiple We're different ways, ways to, that they can be Sure. We can put the boxes out if we want. I mean, um, I'm just are there right. any comments from citizens right now? Okay, thanks. Yeah, but the understanding is we kind of pick our nose for. Can we maybe make sure also to get something on on uh, the chat five? Is there a, like is there a way to put an announcement? We're soliciting input on our goals right now. Maybe. Oh, I you you can put an announcement up, but it's not something that we normally do, right? And it's I mean it's it would be hard to read. I mean it's that they go by pretty fast. This is a lot of information. Well, um, it can go on the website definitely. Yeah, that's easy enough to do once you get the press release. We'll just link it to the website, and I mean that's you know, to say you know can provide input via email or phone call or that's yeah, probably not. Yeah. And maybe that's where we use the survey monkey. There's a link so if you want to type it in there. All right. Okay. Okay. Now we are moving on to <coughs> discussion of utility policy and procedures <coughs> manual. Um, I have a request. Could we flip the report that I'm going to give, which won't be long, but I have invited Susan to come I also have a feeling there are people here to talk about the other subject too, but um, okay, all right, okay, fine. Um, discussion, okay, discussion of utility policy and procedures. Okay. Um, we had hoped to have a good portion of the draft complete utilities policy and procedure manual done, but once the staff started discussing certain points of it, they got into some. I'm going to call them philosophical discussions. Um, so uh, we thought that we would start with the delinquency policy 
um, because it is essential that we get something done about the delinquency policy one way or the other um, because of the numbers that Melissa did present to council at the last meeting. Um, the policy that is in front of you um, from this point on um, is this, the policy that we have in effect right now, today. Starting with the, the, the only thing new on here is the first two paragraphs. Yeah, that's what I thought. So um, after that, everything is simply cut and pasted from the codified ordinances. Um, so the first two paragraphs are essentially what council discussed at the last meeting, um, is, which says that in the case of rental properties that they, the bill for that property shall remain with that property. Um, and that the owner of that property shall be determined by whoever is on the Green County Auditor's website as the owner of that property. Um, this means that um, this means that the you can you can do it. There are different ways to do it. If um, let's say I think Lori, you own a rental property, um, you would have a couple of different. Uh, okay. You would have a couple of different options on how you want that property to be built. You can have that property built to you directly. You can pay the bill and then you can either have it as part of your rental agreement that a certain amount is included um, in the rent and then any overage or underage is adjusted on the next month's uh, bill. You can have it that the bill comes to you and you take it to the renter and they have to pay it. Um, either directly to you or to us, however you want to handle it. You can have it go to the renter, um, but then you, you, know, you would not get notified until that bill goes delinquent. Um, but if the bill does go delinquent um, and is not paid and exceeds $500, then once a year as we go on, um, it would get assessed to the property taxes for that property. Because here we can only assess once a year, I believe it's in September, um, that the Green County Auditor allows you to assess. So if a bill went delinquent in, say, January, it would not get assessed until um, September. But you also, if we disconnected service to their property, then you would not be able to have that service reinstated until the bills were paid. The past two bills were paid for the property. Okay, so if, if it did stay in the renter's name, mm -hmm. and the, the renter got the bill, mm -hmm. when would the property owner, at what point, would the, what would trigger the property owner knowing that there was a delinquency on that account? It would go delinquent, um, and that would trigger a notice to the property owner. Okay. I'm sorry, I couldn't get the answer. I said if it, if it went delinquent, then that would trigger a notice to the property owner that it was delinquent. Come on, you have to come up. <coughs> Peggy Erskine. And does it go the length one the first month? It does. So if the person does not pay the bill on 15, when would the property owner find that out? I'm trying to think how how long after that it is that the delinquent notices go out. It might be in here. It says if the utility service is <coughs> fall within 30 days after the utility bill is issued, right. the customer's account shall be classified as delinquent. If the customer's account is delinquent at the time of issuance of the next regular utility bill, that such utility bill will be stamped with a delinquent notation. Right, so right now the delinquent, the way it works is if you don't pay your bill and you go 30 days past you, you're considered delinquent. And the only thing that happens, well, the, I shouldn't say the only thing because they're actually doing more downstairs, but the first thing that happens is your next bill gets a delinquent stamp on it. But what would have to happen if you decided to leave it in the renter's name is that um, at that point, when they're they're getting the bill that's stamped delinquent, you're going to get either a, a copy of that bill or a letter that says your property's gone delinquent. If if I if the bill is due on the 15th mm -hmm. and I choose to go to the office on the 16th 
Will they tell me whether that bill was paid or not? Oh, yes. Yeah. As a property owner? As, the pro As a property yeah. owner? We can make the, we can make the form that says it's your property and you, you can actually make a form that says this is the property it's owned by Peggy Erskine at this address she chooses to have the bill sent to and you can choose yourself or the renter and you can say send it to the renter but if you come in on the 16th and that property is your property according to our policy you have the right to know if it's been linked or not so that's not it's not going to create a problem with rights of privacy for the tenant I, we did it every day in ways where and, and it's already been determined that utility because we're a municipal utility our utilities all of the information is public information right right I can walk in down there and and say is Mary Ann McQueen going to in her utility bill as a, as a citizen and they would have to tell me because public yeah, documents when we when we signed up for our utility bill way back when um, we signed a contract with the village mm -hmm. that we would pay that bill mm -hmm. do tenants who have the, the the utility put in their name do they not sign a contract with it's you? a little bit different because for instance when i first came here and i was living in the apartment i had to do that for my electric and it, the electric went in my name it wasn't in my landlord's name he paid everything else but the electric was in my name and um, I was responsible for paying it and then I had to put a hundred dollar deposit down and then once I closed out my account and they made sure I paid my last bill and everything got paid then I got a refund back so so that's the way it happens today but a lot of times the bills exceed the deposit or the people simply they come in they close out their account um, and then they the they just move and then the it just doesn't cover what's it what's there for, for instance if I had an electric bill is more than a hundred dollars um, then it wouldn't have covered it but but their contract was with you yeah so, we try not to do this back and yeah, forth right? um, thing so yeah um, how do we get our questions answered you can't do it back and forth i mean it, yes there's a contract between anybody who takes that opens a utility account in the village but the question is is that contract going to be in the name of the renter or is it going to be in the name of the property owner and if we're going to leave it the responsibility for that account with the property owner then it should be a property owner's right to choose whether that contract is in the renter's name or their, it stays in their name. Well, if the contract is in the renter's name, it seems, I don't know how you can make someone else responsible for the contract if the renter's on. Okay. Um, <coughs> I think that we're going to... One, one, we'll, one of the problems that we've had is that then when you're between renters, nobody's paying. Right. And then property owners are just letting the village eat that and everybody else is, buy, is paying for the expense uh, of somebody's profit-making business, which is renting out rental units in this town. But it seems that this policy is um, shifting the responsibility again from the tenant to the owner. I mean, it, would, it seems to me it would encourage the tenant not to pay. But I think it, that, as Lori <coughs> said, landlords are our business i mean it is a business and there are certain types there are certain things that need to be done to be effective in that business and um you know we've got to run our utilities in a more business-like fashion sam did you have some you want to from say somebody else point there. you, you need to come, come up and introduce yourself sam young i'll have more comments later i just wanted to say with this conversation we at Millworks get bills when a tenant leaves for the interim period. It does not. It's, we do we, not expect the village to eat that. We have it set up so that the bill automatically goes in our name and we pay it. And we have 
we do have landlords who, who do that and are responsible, but we also have landlords who say, uh, nobody's living there and I'm not making any money off of it, so I'm not paying it in between. Which is part but of I'm the not sure that that's, I'm yeah. not sure that that in, need, can be right. solved in this situation. That is more village action. I think that's a collection action. But it, well, it, it in, becomes in an case. assessment too, though. In the case of the there. owner that's not paying it in between tenants, then you've got a person who owns the property who is also consuming whatever is in there. And that, I think, can get put right on their tax assessment. Right. It's exactly. a very different question than um, a tenant who defaults on his bill and you automatically send that bill over to the landlord. That I don't approve of. I oppose it and I'll tell you why when I get my <coughs> business. Um, is there more information? Do we feel yeah. like we need more information from staff? Well, I have a question. Um, how, long, how long does uh, the village wait once an account has been <coughs> to cut off service? Is there, do you know? Has it, there been a standard it, practice? It's when it goes 30 days, delinquent. And then they the, cut, off, cut, cut off, off service in 30 cut days. Off, cut off we service. Shut off yeah. the electricity? Not the winter not time, but right. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cut off the water, cut off the... Even in the winter? On day not 31? The, the only thing you can't shut off the winter is the electricity. And the village has been consistent <clears throat> as far as you know in doing this? Mm -hmm. Yeah, our guys do and shut off every And how, how have we incurred such high... Uh, because default. Because when the, the way the policy currently reads, let's say a tenant leaves and they have an outstanding bill that is not covered by the deposit, okay? We cannot, as this is currently written, deny service if the landlord puts another tenant in there. So the tenant, they put another tenant in there, if somebody comes to open a new account, we have to reinstate the service the way the current policy reads. So we can't, we don't have a way to collect that past due because that tenant is gone. So the past due that we have, except for in the winter, which probably wouldn't count for us, <coughs> except for the, in the winter, is basically just a one month utility, one month utility bill. Well, some we people, if, we do have some people who are on payment plans. We do have some people who are very high users and, and have very high bills because it's, they have a large number of people living in the residence or they just aren't judicious with their use. But <coughs> essentially, yes. Can this all be resolved simply with the second paragraph? That that if there is an unpaid balance, that there will not be new service provided, meaning that it's up to the property owner. If the property owner has to deal with it then, or they're going to be sitting there without a tenant in their property. That would certainly go a long ways towards it. I would, I would object to that. I would too. I mean, that's absurd. Well, it is. I want to... Can we get a better handle on how this is being handled? Have we gotten got in, in other communities? In the majority of communities, um, this, this it stays with the property. Okay. It stays with the property. And I think it's even when we met with business. the... When we just have to accept it. It is a cost of doing business. Yeah. Even when we met with the auditor and he looked, remember Brian, when we had, he came and brought the draft report, um, he even said that our delinquency was extremely high and we did not ask him, he volunteered that in most communities that stays with the property and that we may want to look at changing our policy to be that way, which was what we had already talked about, but he volunteered that this is the way most communities do it. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Sam. Mm -hmm. I'll try to keep it to three minutes, but I don't know. I'm Sam Young, um, and I oppose this policy change. Um, in my career, I have worked for many organizations, um, private sector and public, for-profit and non-for-profit, and any organization that I've ever worked for that accepts future commitments to pay, whether they're retailing a product retailing electric service or accepting future um, promises for contribution. They all have the same concern and that is 
what do we do about and with uh, uncollectible accounts? Now, every one of those organizations has accounted for uncollectible accounts as a line item expense like other expenses. That's the part about running a business, and it's your business more than private businesses. Your contract is with the consumer of electricity or water. And I think the reason that many other communities get away with that is because few people are ready to take on a $20,000 lawsuit over $100,000 worth of electric and sewer and water. That doesn't make it right. I think it is legally suspect to sign a contract with one person and expect when that person defaults to dump the responsibility onto a third party I think is absolutely ridiculous. Normally, if it's accounted for as a line item expense, it flows through to total expenses and is one of the major determinants in pricing. And that is your alternative rather than dumping it onto a single person. And under that alternative, Here's the impact. Instead of dumping it on one person, the entire community shares it in proportion to their consumption. And that, I think, is the way it should be. Now, in my mind, um, the legal stuff is questionable. Even if you accept that, I think the question of what's right comes into play, and it is definitely not right to charge one person's for another's one person for another's delinquency. So in my mind, this policy fails on the legal scale, and it fails on the moral scale, and it fails on the business and finance scale. It's simply not good. And I would encourage you not only to disregard it, but to trash it. The legal aspect could be uh, alleviated by leaving it in the property owner's name and the property owner has to sign the contract for the services. If they wish to have the bill sent to the tenant, they can, but if the contract would stay in their name. Um, I guess I would like to say, I have a rental, you know, I have a rental unit and I agree with Lori that this is, it is a business and the idea, I think what I hear you saying, Sam, is that um, you're suggesting that the village should just accept that there are going to be delinquencies and that the cost, that loss, should be just spread out across the rest of the villagers. And, and I, I think that's what you're saying. And I have to say, I don't agree with that. I do think if I have a rental property, then I'm, I'm making money off that rental property and I need to be able to treat it like a business and make sure that the people pay. So, this is interesting because I remember when this proposal was first made a few months ago that the manager at that time said that there were tools that landlords could have from the village utility to help them if they were to be responsible for this delinquent bill. I don't see any tools given to the landlord included here. I have learned just this evening that it's that it, uh, today that it's possible that we can find out if a uh, utility bill that's that is the tenant's responsibility, we can find out if it's in uh, current status or not. Well, that's good to know because that at least gives us the opportunity to evict someone if they're not living up to their contract. It takes, what, how long? A month or more to find out that somebody is in arrears. Another month to find out that they're delinquent. It takes weeks after that to evict somebody. And all the time, cons uh, utilities will be being consumed and my liability as a landlord goes up and up and up with no, nothing I can do about it. There is a perverse incentive in this which encourages unscrupulous tenants to continue doing what they've been doing to the village right along. They're not doing it to the village now, they're doing it to the landlord. Okay, it's a business. 
So as a landlord in a business, I now have an additional fairly significant risk to uh, take on. How am I going to deal with that risk? Okay, I could do a damage deposit. How long? How did 400,000 plus dollars in utility bills get that high if there, you know, the, the delinquent utility bills can be hundreds of dollars by the time it's all over, especially in winter when you can't turn off the electricity no matter if anybody pays. So that's still mine to do and I can't really expeditiously do anything to uh, to mitigate my cost. Damage deposit, how much? A few hundred dollars additional to what you already expect someone to pay in case they treat your property badly. How many people who are renters can in reality upfront pay what that extra thousand or so in a de damage deposit? That's not going to work. So the other alternative is to raise rents. And I think you can be sure that if you institute this change, that's what's going to happen. What's that impact going to be on the affordability of housing in Yellow Springs? How many renters are there? How many rental units are what we would consider available for lower income people? What's the impact on all of the people in town who are renters of this policy change, let alone the impact on the landlord? What about the renters? They now, they have no privacy in this regard, and they're going to pay higher rent just because of the action you've taken. You've so. supported affordable housing for a long time with dollars and time and this is in direct contradiction diction to that effort and I think it's something that you owe everybody here in town a mechanism for reconciling that thank you, thank you so <coughs> one mechanism that is available to all property owners is utilities included yeah. Well, it's very, very calm. Utilities included. You you figure out the rent and you you figure out your rent plus utilities what that what that costs a month and you include and they leave the windows open. Well, <laughs> there are ways of uh, this it happens many, many places. I have definitely had places where I had to pay utilities included. Um, and uh, it, you could have like as uh, Patty said earlier, you can do uh, underage charges. If they don't use what what is the average rate, then um, that amount is deducted from their next bill. And, and so as far as the tools and how we could help you as a village, that they wouldn't be included in the policy, but there are things that we could do like, you know, changing the notification policy so that you get notified as soon as possible or, you know, help it when you call your, as I said, it's a public record. You can call the 16th and say, did my tenant pay? If you have a tenant that you have a feeling didn't pay. I mean, there are ways that we can help you. It wouldn't be written as part of this policy. That doesn't mean we wouldn't do it and wouldn't have those available to you. Right, right. I don't we can know write up, we can what write those up options right. are. And I we think could, it's up to you to tell us. Right, and we could come up <laughs> with a list of those things and make that list available to you. That would be very helpful. I mean, I'm, I'm <coughs> thinking. I'm thinking at least. Obviously, we don't have legislation. This is discussion. I'm thinking potentially at least two more meetings. I would like at the next meeting something more specific in terms of the tools. I would also like to see something, you know, some sample language from another community that does this. I, I just, you know, so far, it's, and I will, I will. Um, concede and, and I think the police already did some research to say that the majority um, of municipal utilities do this so I have several examples so I would I would just like to have something more specific to wrap my head around and and maybe even um, talk to um, 
I talked to have Melissa talk to a couple utility departments and find out what issues they deal with, how they deal with these issues. I, I just feel like I need more information. <coughs> I absolutely agree that the citizen that the entire village cannot continue to pay to bear the burden of of this. But um, I do think that, that I think that these that the landlords, the property owners here are bringing up some valid points that they also have um, some difficulties that I would like to understand, have a better understanding of before. This is a pretty big decision. Huge change and will impact a lot of people. And I would like to understand that. Paul, did you want to say something? Just that. You do come to come forward, please. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because that cable guy that films the meetings won't like it if you're not. Right. Paul, I would rather comment on the open window issue that uh, that's against the policies of uh, the goals of the uh, Energy Commission, for instance. Uh, it's just an invitation to waste. And we've seen it. You drive down Quarry Street, you see the windows open in the dormitories <coughs> because those kids aren't paying the utility bills. So they open the window when it's too warm in their room. And with tenants, if, if it's included in the rent, <coughs> then they won't conserve. And we are, one of your goals is energy conservation. And this is in, con in contrast with that goal. Thank you. Thank you. Um, is any other comments, any other direction to give Patty other than comments have been made? I think we just have to, we have to talk about it further. So. Um, I, I do think um, what Lord was talking about, about uh, having rent include a, a, a certain, figuring out a median amount for utilities and then adjusting it month to month, I guess. Um, that uh, developing some kind of process, uh, some kind of form, something about that to show, to, to give to yeah, as landlords. As an average four person household uses XYZ. Or, I mean, no, I can't think they just saying, look at the bills? I mean, yeah. can't, you, can't they just look at the history? Well, and people's, people's habits do vary widely, but yes, we can look at the average use up for a particular property over a period of time. Do we have level billing? Do we offer level billing? Yeah. I mean, is that, maybe Electric. that's something, it, how, is that something that we could explore? I mean, is that somewhat the issue? We have level yeah. billing in electric, I think. Well, in electric, but um, on the other, because electric gets, has it's a wider variations. Right, because we read, um, every three months on the water. So you get an estimated bill for right. two months right. and then your yeah. third month is your catch up month. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, it's a little bit difficult to do it with that. But we can look at, we can pull up a particular property in the utility department and they can look at the average use of that property over a period of time. So if a landlord needs that to look at to try to figure out what they want to include in the rent as a standard. They can do that. They they know who they've had in their property, whether it was two people, three people, four people. I, I guess I don't want to throw a monkey wrench into this, but saying that we leave it the way it is, then what is the future impact on our present rates? Well, there there's no reason to believe that it's going to change if you leave it the way it is. No, 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 no. In, in other words, if we could continue to lose money mm -hmm. due, due to the lenders, mm -hmm. then that says if we want to get out of the hole, then we won't have to raise rates on the rest of the community. That's correct. Okay. So, what is, so the question I'm, I'm asking is, given what we, what we have, mm -hmm. okay, how much will we have to raise our rates to recoup that loss? And you don't have to figure it yeah, out. Don't, I, that, yeah, that's, I mean, that's, that's in the weeds. Yeah, that's, that's, um, that's, um, I think it is yeah. a, a philosophical it's, it's, yeah, question. But, right. But some folks it, it would be have, substantial. Yeah, but some folks do have that opinion that we as a business, but, you know, putting ourselves on the business side, it's accounts receivable that you didn't collect. So, and, and we can't really 
<laughs> show a loss. We're supposed to show that we're breaking even. Right. So we, we'll, we got to do something. If, if we don't put it on the landlords and we try to spread it over, that's, that's the cost of living here. That language see, you know. So I'm just throwing that out as it's, uh, another variable thing. Can we move to the next uh, item? Peggy, can you, can you, one minute. Yeah. <laughs> can, can we put something in the utility bill that tells people that this is what's being discussed? Because I've talked to several landlords just in the last two days and they didn't have any idea that this was going on. The bills, I think just, that. well, today was due date, wasn't it? So um, it can go, we can put it on the next bill or it'll be in the packet on the website. But it's on the website, it's in the paper. It's where everything that gets discussed at the council table it normally is. If you want to call it out, you can. I don't know if it'll be there in time though. March 2nd. I mean, yeah, I mean, if we start to pull, if we start to pull things out of our agenda to write, to write press releases about just to get people to pay attention, we're going to have a, newspaper full of press releases if people people are interested in what's happening you know they need to i mean i send a we yeah. i send an email yeah. every week anybody wants my email i covered this i pulled that out anybody wants my email every week it's short doesn't take long to read laurieasklund at gmail.com um i certainly uh it's the, the newspaper covers it i i we've we've had this on our agenda several times uh, i realize it's hard to keep track but there are lots of ways for people to find out you need to be more clear if you pull this agenda off this off of here and put it in the newspaper there's a single landlord that would be any better before. right i'm saying i explain every agenda item in my email every week and i will send it to anybody who wants it and that's also why we have discussions before we make any decisions right this is the beginning of our discussion hopefully it will be in the paper now hopefully the word will get out I mean we don't make decisions um, without at least a couple of meetings of discussion before we get the legislation okay um, moving on next item on the agenda and thanks for being patient is um, a report on the climate action uh, committee. Yeah, I don't, I don't think so. I'm, no, I'm giving an order about this. Oh, is that what you're talking about? Yeah, no, I, go ahead. Okay. Um, so there, there's been a, a group that has been meeting, and I have given some oral reports, and I wanted to let council and citizens know some of the activities that the group has been doing, and we will be having a written, more full written report or one of the March meetings, I think. But uh, at any rate, was anyone was anyone in this room? Did anyone go to the climate action march? And <coughs> I, I mean, <laughs> at any rate, yeah, on September twenty first, uh, four hundred thousand people from this country went to march for climate action change uh, in New York City and there were uh, 2,600 events around the world at the same time so I, I think none of us went to any of these events apparently but I think everyone knows that ordinary citizens have decided that since uh, the federal government is not doing a lot and our state Ohio is doing even less that if we really care about the planet, it has to come down to the grassroots level and to the community level. So um, there are various communities around the country that have been looking at what, as a community, uh, both uh, for the citizens, for the organizations, and for the uh, city or municipal governments, what, what can be done to lower our carbon footprint. And um, a lot of communities are looking at it more holistically to look at things like local food production, how can um, looking at lowering our carbon footprint, how can that uh, help with sustainable economic development. Um, uh, so there are 
frequently it's food production, transportation, economic development, education, um, how we do our buildings, uh, waste reduction, and uh, renewable energy, and using less energy. Those are, tend to be the areas. So we've had a group that's had about, at various meetings, about 60 people, and we've been meeting for several months um, since the uh, event in New York City, and some specific things that we've done. Um, 11 of us went to Oberlin, Ohio to visit. We met with uh, the head of their electric department in the city of Oberlin. By the way, Oberlin is about twice as big as Yellow Springs. The college is about 10 times the size of um, Antioch. And um, they have created a climate action plan and they are, even though Oberlin has not necessarily as a looking fully through the community, what the village, the, what the city, the college, and the citizens have done is not necessarily more, in some cases, less than what Yellow Springs have done. Because they have this climate action plan, and because they've gotten uh, in <coughs> money from some different sources, now they're being, you know, they're getting publicity about that. And they're, and, and they're going to be a place where people who, or businesses that are interested in doing this kind of thing are going to be attracted to. But Yellow Springs has done a whole lot of things that Oberlin has done. Um, another thing that has happened is last Saturday, not, no, not this past Saturday, the Saturday before that, um, a Green Environmental Coalition sponsored a, a film at uh, the Little Art called The Clean Bin Project. And Tom Clevenger, who had worked um, on lowering waste production when he was on the West Coast, uh, hosted a discussion after that uh, film. The film was excellent. It, tr it showed a, a couple in uh, Canada who had a contest against each other about how little waste they could produce. And they each had like a, a waste bin about this big. And at the end of a year, that they both had only that much waste. So they recycled stuff or they didn't use it. Um, the third, a, th a third thing that's happening is that uh, we're developing a website that can be used by citizens, by businesses, by the village government to look at how you can lower your energy use, um, grow, what you can do about food, what, you know, have all different sections. Um, there was another group that read the book, This Changes Everything by Naomi Klein. Um, and so we have a small working group. Um, I'm on that group, uh, Mark is on that group, Susan is on that group, and uh, they're uh, Dewart from the, en from the Environmental Commission is on <coughs> it, and Rick Walkie from the uh, Energy Board is on it. So, we, we have a goal of working toward actually having Yellow Springs develop a climate action plan. And we're, I want to keep bringing this to council because I would like, my vision is that the village government will get involved with this at one point. And I invited Susan Jennings from Community Solutions to come to just briefly say what her background is in having done some of this work so that you might get a little sense of what we might so, Susan, thank you, Marianne. Um, so, again, my name is Susan Jennings, and I'm executive, uh, the new executive director at Community Solutions. And I came here from Massachusetts, where I was uh, director of the Office of Campus and Community Sustainability at UMass Dartmouth. And while I was there, I led the um, development and implementation of a climate action plan for the university. I also worked with the city of New Bedford on sustainability plan, and I was um, co-founder and co-chair of the Regional Council on Sustainability. And just, um, I, this is a bad time of night, you guys have yeah. been talking a lot, but I just would wanna say a few things in terms of the, the possibilities for the village is that um, towns and cities that have done climate action plans have often found that there are uh, financial savings for the town. There's possibilities for economic development. A, a number of the goals and um, issues that were discussed tonight, including renter's energy use, there, though, all of those really are interwoven with the idea of a climate action plan. Uh, the other exciting thing that happens um, often when communities get together for climate action is that there's a, um, 
there's a, a, a collaborative spirit that develops uh, among the different constituencies that get involved. And um, Marianne mentioned some of the things that are going on. The UU Church has been doing things, the Quaker um, community has been doing things to come to so land trust, uh, Antioch. So, and all these people, it, things get catalyzed and, and grow. Um, when they're done in conjunction with one another. So I think it's a very exciting opportunity for Yellow Springs. And I also think that it is a, a real opportunity for us to show our leadership because so much has already, we all, uh, all the way back from Oberlin, we were all saying Yellow Springs has done like so much of what Oberlin has done. And in some cases, even, even more. And Oberlin's received money from the Joyce Foundation, the Kresge Foundation, the Clinton Foundation. So I, I think there is, you know, it's not going to happen next week that we, you know, receive some kind of foundation money. But I think there's a real opportunity, again, both in terms of reducing um, costs uh, for the, the Yellow Spring, um, Yellow Spring householders, but then also the Yellow Spring government. Uh, along with that, I think there's a real opportunity of developing um, external sources of funding um, for the initiative and for the town. So I'm um, looking forward to working with everyone on it. Thanks. Thanks. Okay. Thanks. Um, <coughs> so, manager report. Uh, we'll go through this really quickly. Um, we've already talked about the first one. Uh, just wanted to let everyone know that Chief Hill <coughs> has had the black charger repainted white. Um, and it is uh, being outfitted as a cruiser. Is it on the road yet, Chief? Uh, it's figured up so, tomorrow. Okay. Um, he will be, uh, be also doing that with the uh, Ford Explorer that we got from uh, the uh, task force once he takes possession of that. We did submit an application to host the two ICBA International <coughs> Fellows. Um, the project that we submitted for them to work on was a, uh, a social media policy for both uh, village employees and commission members as well as social media presence for the village, um, and Brian is helping a great deal. He's helping John and I with that. Um, the village public works employees will be installing a new stormwater line along Davis Street. They were gonna do that this week, but um, the weather's a little bit cold for them to be out there digging. So uh, instead, they will be starting on the council chamber renovation tomorrow. Uh, staff is meeting with both RCAP and John Courtney on the rate studies, and we will keep those posted, uh, keep you posted on those. We did have the bid opening for the water loop completion projects. The bids were very competitive with the engineer's estimate, um, somewhat lower. We're going <coughs> the references on the uh, lowest bidder, and we should have some uh, legislation come before council at the next meeting to award that project. Um, I did tell you that the council chamber renovations start tomorrow. Um, I wanted to, um, Dewart Headley had asked me to get some information from the Efficiency Smart for him and in doing so. I got a couple of statistics that I thought council would be interested in. These are not in your packet because I got them after the packets went out. But um, I would like to let you know that since the village joined the Efficiency Smart program, um, to date, Village, either residents or businesses, or the village itself, have installed 4,818 measures to increase efficiency. That can be anything from a, a new light fixture to a new hot water heater, um, such as the one I have at my house. Uh, customer lifetime <coughs> savings to date for the village are $1,711,563. And we have an annual CO2 reduction in pounds of 2,845,162 pounds, which is approximately equivalent to 193.2 homes. <coughs> so the, the Efficiency Smart Program is having a <coughs> impact, and they do have promotions going on occasionally. Right now there is a promotion going on in the village where you can go to the, the hardware store and get a, uh, a pack of LEDs or CFLs for a substantially reduced rate. And the last thing that I would like to say is don't forget, y'all are judging the chili soup cook-off on Friday at 11.30. Uh, it's my latest team building exercise. So, uh, and then village employees will be eating said entries for their lunch immediately following. So we will see you all at 11.30 on Friday. And we <coughs> share those statistics with the energy board? Uh, I will. Thank you. 
And uh, so far we have 11 entries, so be ready. Ooh. What time is the chili cooking? 11.30. <coughs> uh, two chilies, uh, three chicken noodle soups, one being with bacon, a couple of vegetable soups. So. So will we be getting enough tasting to, for our lunch? You may be getting enough tasting for your lunch, and there will also be desserts. And I will bring some and water for you. In A and B? It's in A and B. Okay. And the winner gets a $20 Subway gift card. White chicken chili, Chief? Chicken chili. <laughs> it will be white. Um, John? I am not going to disclose whether I'm providing a soup or a chili on Friday. Oh, I guess you need my crock pot. Oh. I will need your crock pot. I brought one. <coughs> <coughs> I have one of these three. three. Just a, a heightened suspense. Time they get all those in front of them, they're not going to know who brought one anyway. All right. <laughs> well, uh, my report is pretty straightforward. Uh, last week, uh, went down to went up to uh, four cities with uh, Joe Basil's crew and Jerry uh, to look at some. Uh, Artesian of Pioneer Water Treatment <coughs> uh, with the Arcana Henry Cold Water and New Bremen. Uh, these are all very small scale plants doing about one million uh, gallons per day. Uh, several of them had ion exchange softening, which was different than the uh, sand filtration softening we saw in Jackson County. Uh, last Monday, the Planning Commission met and uh, we heard an approved, they heard approved two applications for initial uses. Uh, one of those is for the Morgan Family Foundation to relocate its offices, 506 South High Street. The other one is to uh, construct a new living space called the Garage and the Raj, and on the way to get South Dean Avenue to vote for approved. Uh, additionally, the minutes for the December 8th meeting from last year uh, were finally approved, so the one uh, alley vacation from Antioch <coughs> uh, will be ready for, as an ordinance for March 2nd, uh, for the meeting of that day. Um, Speaking of Antioch, I met with uh, Reggie um, at Antioch uh, a few weeks ago, and uh, he intended he, uh, and we, we took a tour of the campus, and actually she failed with us, uh, and uh, we looked at the areas that uh, Antioch is proposing the village to vacate uh, rights and ways to certain streets. One of them would be uh, a portion of the western portion of North College Street. The other one would be the western portion of Herman Avenue from the Cola Sands to Tory. Eastern. Eastern, sorry, yes. The turnaround. Mm -hmm. Eastern sides of those streets. Um, they intend to proceed with the application, so that will be uh, going for the planning commission in April. Uh, and then also the Charette, uh, if you guys don't already know, will be the first week of March. <coughs> and uh, there are flyers out, out there. Finally, I met with Ms. Becca. Uh, last week regarding a uh, proposal to install Wi-Fi in the downtown region of Yellow Springs. Uh, our conversations, conversations are still continuing, but the Wi-Fi coverage would uh, be from Dayton Street to Walnut to the Bryan Center, and it will extend south to Limestone down Zena Avenue. So we have, hopefully she has some more information about that in the next week's council meeting. Thank Any you. Any questions? Thank you. Um, still a lot of public record requests coming in. Still a steady stream of minutes. Um, I've gotten through reading the drafts for the updates for the charter, or for the, I'm sorry, for the codified ordinances and said okay to American Legal and they will send all the bazillion copies that need to get inserted into the books shortly, which thankfully that bet will be doing. And we hope you feel better. Can I do, you, you say one, because every, every meeting you say we'll get a lot of requests for public information. Um, From where? Well, I'm, I'm not, it's, it's, how is that impacting your getting the other stuff done? It depends on what the request is. Okay. Some of them take about five minutes and some of them take an hour. Okay. And some of them go through my office because, we, for instance, we had one from uh, the Day Daily News that um, we have to go back for five years worth of, of records. So it, it's going to take a while, and everything's been working on that. So. Okay, okay. Uh, standing reports. Uh, we'll start with Lori. 
Uh, planning Commission, he uh, has already given really the report John has, and um, uh, <coughs> the county. <coughs> you, went to that. you went to that one. Thank you. Um, they're still talking about um, you know whether it's whether planning commission is going to be taken over by um, the Green County. You got to go to the Green to go to Green County. It's still up for still being in discussion. Jerry. Finance Committee, uh, Melissa again was able to uh, reconcile the checking, uh, checking accounts with bank statements. Since we're just in month one, um, nothing there's nothing, nothing to look at. Okay. And um, but as we move forward, uh, but I do believe we have to approve. Uh, have to accept the financial report. Uh, I think all we have to do is accept <coughs> So, do I make a, should I make a motion? Make the motion. I make the motion that uh, you accept the uh, financial report. In, uh, what's the, what's the January. Was it ending? Was it ending? Ending thirty one. Yeah. Ending thirty one. January. Second. Second. Oh, no, no, no. I have a comment. Two comments. Mm -hmm. um, one is just about paper and electronic, that I think it's a waste of paper to put all of that in court every month for those of us who use paper. I'm happy to just look at it electronically. But the other thing is that on the summary of the financial report, <coughs> so she has the summary page and then she has like wow, tens of <coughs> pages, right? I'd like to see the budget on the summary. The, the way in the I'm not talking well I, I'm not talking about the bank reconciliation I'm talking about the budget report there's one page of summary and then there are all the rest of the pages of you want just this on the county page got it that yeah that I'd like to have the budget on yes. that page yes. that page exactly because that's where I'm going to look at it I'm not going to look at every single line item to see if it's within the budget sure. but I have <coughs> yeah, she, what she's talking about is the monthly summary. Yeah, it's not. I mean, this is this will be. Um, I think she's going to do you this page every month for that month. But you want, but you want the, the year-to-date budget listed this way as well. Well, can you, just, can you integrate the? Can you? I mean, the budget was the budget line was included in the breakdown and I don't you want to roll you want the, the budget line rolled up to the summary. Yes, okay. I would like that gotcha. because then well, then I you understand what you're yes. I wonder if this is going to be a uh, if this is going to require a motion and approval every month. I wonder if it makes sense to not have it just down here buried in standing reports, but um, other boards I'm a part of have a thing called a consent agenda, which basically means, um, you know, this is this is going to be kind of the standing things like minutes, um, reports, and everything is that you accept the the consent is that you accept the report. Um, I wonder if if there's a way to get this, I don't know this this one in particular. It seems like we're required to do this. Having it very you want to you want to change review of minutes to consent agenda to include both the budget approval and the minutes. Right. I think that would be good. Okay. And then if people don't have any changes to any of that, then they just say consent to it. Okay. And we don't go through. So that means we don't go even go through the minutes. Yeah. So it would be up to a person who had a change to say. <laughs> right. Karen would just say, are there any changes? Mm -hmm. And if there aren't, then there would be a motion to approve. Mm -hmm. Now, the other part of that is uh, on a quarterly basis, we're going to okay. identify uh, watch areas. Mm -hmm. You're going to get pie charts so you can, mm -hmm. I call them pie charts, but she's going to give you different graphs and so you can kind of see how we're doing. 
from expenditures from basically what you have to be expenditures and what we the the, the 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 problem with income is we only get income twice a year. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm a big okay. Now we will get revenue on, on, on water, sewer, electric, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, from the general revenue uh, On those, you could put it under um, special reports. Yeah, I think for that month. Yeah, I think mm -hmm. yeah, quarterly yeah. reports right. would be right. under special reports, but that they're uh, it, the financial should be under. I think a, a kind of consent agenda. And if we're in, is there a way to, to roll what Rachel does the the report that the treasurer does into that? She typically does a quarterly report yeah it's on your next it's a, it's up for your next meeting yeah, I asked Melissa well, where she wanted it yeah once we see you know, maybe <laughs> after this after, after she gives it then we'll yeah. see <laughs> if we can make a correlation okay. oh Diane there's no non <laughs> okay. Um, okay that's easy. so we do have it but we do have a motion and we do okay. need to approve at this at this right. point all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Okay, uh, you got the library <coughs> report. Uh, I have a, a kind of synopsis of what uh, mediation folks have done at the next, next meeting. Uh, you have to go through that and tie it up with some other issues. So that's <coughs> going on. So. And then community resource. Uh, we met and we're still discussing what they might do. I guess I'm going to go jump back to Lori. She has a nomination. I forgot. Uh, no, it was my fault. I was like, oh, we covered all of this. And then I realized, oh, wait, I have a nomination. Uh, Jerry and I have uh, interviewed Adam Abraham. You have his, um, his summary of his, his background. Um, we would like to nominate him as an alternate to the planning commission. He is uh, Mayor Corvista at Yellow Springs Home Inc. <coughs> He's a young man, and um, I think he'll, he'll be good in this position. Can I second? Can I ask one question? I mean, because I know Adam and I absolutely agree he'd be a great addition, but is he a short timer in the village? No, I no. had talked to him. Yeah. Yeah. Right, we both thought, we, and we actually talked to him separately, and now <coughs> okay. he plans on being Okay. Good. Yeah. I mean, obviously, that can change for anybody. Yeah. And right. I just. I mean, this. I mean, this is to the. Yeah. A no. Short he. Time. He made it. He. I, we both asked him kind of at length about that separately. Mm -hmm. And. Uh, no. He is. He was enrolled at Antioch, uh, and he's looking to possibly uh, enroll in one of the other uh, colleges and universities. Okay. He's kind of changing direction. Okay, great. Um, so we have a nomination for Adam, is it Abraham? Abraham. Abraham. Um, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Um, I'm going to start with the Charter Review Committee, which we'll, we'll add on in the future. Um, so uh, we had our first meeting, and we elected officers. We already mentioned that. There was an updated schedule that was included in the packet, and uh, we are basically going to start getting into the nitty gritty uh, at our next meeting, which is the 22nd. 24th, thank you. Okay. Um, Human Relations Commission, um, just a couple things to add. On April 24th, we're going to do the conflict resolution training. Um, and we're going to be, we've got high school students participating, Antioch students, hopefully some village staff. We're going to be sending out some invites, kind of targeted and see where it goes from there. This is a collaboration with Village Mediation. And the other document that was in the packet um, was the sample resolution from Athens uh, about marriage equality. And so this is something that was uh, brought to the HRC by Mary Ann after discussion. The HRC made a recommendation, or is making a recommendation, that we adopt something similar in Yellow Springs. And they're also willing to help draft that. So I guess I'd like to make a motion, uh, a recommendation that we do, uh, in fact, look at a resolution on marriage equality. So we'll put that under future agenda items? Yeah. <coughs> do, we want to, do we want to assign or do we need 
between having the next meeting or do we want to you mentioned march 16th well, um the group marriage matters is having a blitz um march 16th starting march 16th through that week and i think we meet on march 16th yes, so it seems like that would be a okay. good time to bring the resolution for a vote can you um just can we have the legislation ready for the next meeting just so it can be in the packet preliminarily sure yeah uh aaron sorry agreed to work on that so mm -hmm. i will and we've got a template that will then customize so we can have that on march 2nd sounds good um community access panel uh one of the things i wanted to mention is that uh, gene Payne, who's been doing our programming needs to step back so I do want to thank her for many, many years of volunteering and lots of time. And um, so we're going to be looking at what we can do in the short term with our Miller Fellows. And hopefully we've been on the lookout for more volunteers. So we're keeping that word out. Um, the uh, blurb that was in the packet about the Facebook page. Um, so this is something that uh, I think it's explained pretty well. It is designed to encourage content from the community. It's not connected to community access panel. So uh, the question is, can we revive this Facebook page, particularly our Miller fellow with uh, Paul's support, um, and I guess getting permission to do that from council. Um, so. You know, I know we haven't developed a social media policy for village Facebook pages, but this Facebook page is basically, we've nicknamed it a producer's page. Well, this is the one that David was talking about doing for the Antioch, primarily for the Antioch students. Right, to try to get Antioch students and, and also community members to be involved. Um, okay, one. Uh, providing content for the station oh, uh, okay. and volunteering. You, you talked about that earlier. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I guess uh, it's it's there, and then it's just a matter of if we are okay with, with that uh, being used. Uh, so in the short term, uh, David will, and um, Paul will help him with that. Uh, it was originally set up by the community access station, and um, moving forward, uh, we've talked about you know how, what are we going to do with the station to sort of keep it moving. You know, are we going to have uh, volunteers, some kind of position, but at least for now, it would be part of David's project to encourage volunteers to contribute to the station. But it is, I mean, it's, it is representing the village, and, and I mean, it, if you're asking our permission, it's clearly representing the village. I think it's in a gray area. Um, I mean, when you look at it, I mean, it's things like, you know, saying, hey, the Bulldog News had, like, the science show today and trying to entice people to get involved with the station. Um, and I think that's, I mean, it's probably better if we don't, I mean, it, it should be probably kind of independent in a way, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, I mean, it's, it's definitely not connected to somebody us. Somebody decides that, that, that they want to cheerlead that station independently but if it becomes our responsibility, then and in a way by approving or making a motion, then we've kind of said it is our responsibility. Right. If somebody wants to independently say, I'm a fan of the Village Cable, and I'm going to celebrate Village Cable. Anybody has the right to do that. Well, I think, I mean, maybe the way to do both things, just as a suggestion, is allow David to revive the Facebook page as to be used by the Antioch students and they can submit content to Paul to show on cable access with cable access panel's approval. I mean that way the, the site itself isn't directly tied to the, the village but they do have the right to submit content like anybody else, right Paul? Yeah, I'm just saying I don't know that we uh, yeah, I, I don't think I don't want to pick and choose. Yeah. We haven't. We because haven't. If they want to do it. Out. Yeah, they should do it as independent people. Right. But if so, like I can be a fan of CBS News. You know, I can make my own Facebook page. Fans of CBS News and CBS News is not responsible for that content. 
I can say I'm a fan of Yellow Springs News. And this is just for fans of Yellow Springs News. Right. And, you know, Yellow Springs News is not responsible for the content in any way. I think it's kind of similar. If he wants to do it kind of as a fan, uh, then he should do it. But I think if, if we say, yes, we give you permission to do this, then at some level we create it. Right. And then if it gets dropped out and there's like bad, slanderous things getting put up there and nobody's paying attention to it anymore, then somehow we've we've kind of taken some responsibility. Out. Right. We don't have social media policy and I don't think it makes sense to pick and choose and just say, oh, we can do this one. And because then it is ours. Um, I think whatever Patty said, if yeah. you think whatever Patty said, works. Yeah, let, let David uh, revive that page as his own page and, and draw the users to it and then the content from that page can be submitted like any other content to the station through fall to be played on the station with, with approval. Yeah, that, that sounds good. Kind of serves both purposes. Yeah, it is a personal page, so it was under Jean's Facebook page. Yeah, before, I, don't, so. I don't want us to make any yes. any action. Okay, that's perfect. And then um, I wanted to also announce that a fiber forum has been planned. Um, it's through the Springs Net group, uh, but they are asking for the community access panel to support that. It's going to be on April 25th uh, from 9 to 1 at the Education Service Center uh, hosted by Becca. Oh, not fiber, it's in fabric fiber. Right. <laughs> this, is, uh, this is our <laughs> municipal broadband. It's on Saturday? Uh, that's a Saturday from 9 to 1, that's right. Um, and so uh, that group is working on it, and they are going to sort of continue to report back to CAP on their progress. Okay. Um, and then Public Art Commission, uh, I wanted to mention briefly that tomorrow we're going to be looking at, uh, what is it, 90% of the final plan for the R Yes. And to approve that, and they've given, given us a timeline for uh, the project to be done in April. And which part? Uh, the upgrades skate to the skate park. Um, I included the press release about the VITA, the Village Inspiration and Design Award, so we're seeking nominations for that. Uh, again, I just wanted to emphasize that uh, we're still looking for sponsorship for the Arcans. At this point, uh, 4,500 has been raised by uh, private sponsors, which I think is pretty impressive. And the last thing, and uh, we don't have to go into detail about it tonight, but uh, based on our discussion to for council and commissions to work um, together more and understand what uh, each other are doing, and in particular, Jerry's comment from the last meeting made me think about the document that we included, which are recommendations for what the Public Art Commission's 2015 goals and objectives could be. And uh, I, I thought it would be good to sort of establish a model that other commissions could follow that would allow us to communicate more. If you look at what's on the list, I mean, it's implementing the veto that we've already <laughs> talked about clarifying our scope, which was something Dave Turner brought up, uh, bringing art back to the community gallery and the Bryan Center, uh, responding to the motorcycle noise issue, which uh, we've been working on, uh, a public art fund, which can be talked more about, and then a collaboration with the Environmental Commission. So uh, again, since we're late, I don't want to go into detail, but I think that this could be a starting point for looking at potential goals for a commission and then us talking about what could be prioritized so that there's, again, a two-way uh, discussion on this. Hey, Marianne. All right. Um, first, I would like for the Energy Board to nominate Mark Ewald to be on the Energy Board, and he was here for so long. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was a He left. Um, so you may have seen Mark in the back room. He's a young man who moved to Yellow Springs fairly recently, but he has worked <coughs> four years, I think, with the patchwork um, uh, CSA that comes to the farmer's market. He also has two, he has a bachelor's degree and then a, a master's degree studying at UD under Bob Brecka for sustainable energy. Um, 
He's been coming to the energy board meetings since December. And um, Brian and I interviewed him and felt that he has definitely a good background, really an interest in uh, contributing to the village, and we would like to nominate him for the energy board. Yeah, and I was also really impressed with just his sensitivity to understanding uh, bringing things to council, we need a lot of different uh, information and questions answered. And I think he really had a nice appreciation of that, so. Okay, so there's a motion, I have to order a second. Second. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Okay, um, the energy board um, met on the 10th and uh, Patty attended that meeting. We had had some conversations uh, beforehand uh, with Patty and Johnny, we being uh, Rick Walkie and Bob Brecka and myself. Um, and Bob Brecka also attended that meeting. And uh, the discussion centered on the community solar project, looking at issues around that. Um, I felt like it was a pretty good discussion. Um, so the energy board does plan to come to the, it's the second meeting, I think, in April. In March. Second well, meeting in March. Energy board was the second meeting in March, and, and John Cordy was the first meeting well, in April. You know, our minutes, I think, say April and May. Yeah, May. Was it April and May? So, um, check again. Well, what does the agenda say? Yeah. Energy Board is April 20th. Oh, okay. John Courtney is May 4th, okay. Yeah. You were right. Yeah. So the Energy Board thinks it's going to be March, but unless, unless uh, the Energy Board wants to come in March or Council. I think we've got a pretty, I mean, we, we just yeah. added a lot of stuff to that second meeting in March agenda. So okay. I'd say waiting until April makes sense. They probably want more time to prepare anyway. So. Um, so I think that a lot of uh, looking at talking about the ordinance and about is this commercial or not I mean there were a lot of different topics that got discussed and not there was not unanimity but I think it was a good discussion um, I did meet with Steve Kahn from the school board and um, we agreed that um, we would just stay in touch with each other informally about things that would be coming up from either the school board or the village but things we talked about specifically they are the school board is going to go for actually two levies two renewals um, and uh, I forget when they're going this in uh, like May they're, they're at least they're both, in May. they're both in May they're both in May I believe um, at least are they doing both at the same time? Because I know one is. No, they're going to do one year, one one year, and one the next year. They're staggering them, or they come due at different times. Um, we can. I mean, I think our, one of our goals was to not have. Well, not have it at the same time. I guess not have it at the same time. But we will be if they go in May. I mean, not this May. Oh, well, not this. One May. of them That's is correct. this May. Right. And I thought, I didn't think the other one was for a while, because we just it may not be. So, and I've, I've actually asked Melissa to meet with Dawn, um, oh, what, what am I blanking on her name? Dawn at the school. The school treasurer, Dawn Weller, to uh -huh. kind of get a handle on the schedules. Okay, okay. Um, Steve said that the school, the idea of having community internet in school is interested in that. Of course, the school would be happy to have economic development um, in term and new residents because uh, that money goes to the school. And then, then uh, Steve mentioned one thing about whether the village could charge a property transfer tax. Apparently, there is such a thing as a property transfer tax. There is. Let's talk about it. Let's do some research and talk about it at one other time. Um, environmental commission. Uh, we had a very short meeting before this meeting because we meet on the third Tuesday at 
5.30. So um, I had, after our last, uh, well, after the council meeting in which uh, the <coughs> council decided to not uh, uh, permit the, um, inter the Environmental Commission to go for the grant, I got together with Patty, we met to talk about it, and I think Patty and I were talking about two issues. The prime, well, a primary being to look at how the flow device on the um, glass farm works. And um, another issue about does, do we have to make a full decision about the glass farm before we can talk about that area of being wetlands. So those are the two things we talked about. Since then, well actually today, Patty and Nadia and I met with a villager who is interested, potentially interested in giving a substantial amount of money to, to serve probably as an endowment. If we do move forward with allowing uh, the naturalization of this area, of uh, becoming a, a wet, a natural area park, um, that this, that there's the potential for a substantial uh, amount of money <coughs> to create an endowment for long-term maintenance. Um, so um, we're pretty excited about that possibility. Obviously we have to, uh, there's some steps before that would happen, but we do want to be continuing to work. Okay. Um, Chamber, we have our annual meeting this Thursday at Antioch University Midwest. Um, then on March 19th, I'm really excited about the meeting we have. It's um, Ertl Publishing is uh, sponsoring it. It will be here at A and B, and they they have a whole new division that's doing um, marketing and advertising, um, and they're bringing in some specialists in social media to talk about how things have changed in social media for business and how we need to be looking at something besides Facebook. Um, that's, March that's March 19th at noon and there will be lunch provided. That's being provided by Earl Publishing. Um, let's see. Um, the um, MVRPC, I did not go, I wasn't able to go to that meeting. Um, dates change because of holidays, I think. I was able to go. I don't know. Are you? You didn't go to that one either, did you? No. Nope. There isn't a whole lot on their agenda right now. I will say. Um, so future agenda items. Um, okay. So I just added for the council. I don't want to talk about it. Uh, what I want to do is start to gather council retreat topics. You guys send me stuff. Send ideas to me at the next meeting. I want to come with something prepared with some suggested retreat, retreat topics. I work with Judy on locations, um, and also send me some dates. I mean, let's let's look at you know like mid March to mid April. Let's try to focus on that time frame. If you're going to be gone, I mean, maybe not dates you want, but if you're going to be gone or things that are impossible, send me those. Um, it's typically been during the week, you know, not on a weekend. We could do a Saturday if somebody wants, but it's typically been during the week. So just send, send me that information. So we'll come with something. Maybe we can actually make some decisions at the next meeting about the retreat. Um, so we've got cap annual reports, sidewalk. And will Jason be ready for that next meeting? He says he will. Um, okay. I will ask him tomorrow and confirm that. So we'll know that agenda planning. Okay. Um, any, what, about, what else did we just so add? The ordinance for the alley vacation. A revised goals. I think that's still going to be under old business. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. But it's, I would we just want to have any special reports? The cap. The cap the oh. Has planning hmm. commission been put on the docket? In the uh, the day was the deadline for allocation. No, she, she, she means the annual report. Oh, sorry. Um, let's see, lots of goals. Will we have more on ordinances, or on, on commissions, or what do we, what do we uh, just, just the roles and responsibilities, um, but the ordinance won't come back probably till the first meeting in April. Okay. 
Okay. Do you want, did you want the legislation for the 10% per rate increase? Yeah. Yes. <coughs> well, we should have probably mentioned it then, um, and I'm not going to mention it now. Um, why don't we, I know there's a lot on this second one, but I, I, yeah, let's have it as a discussion item next week. The next okay. meeting. Discussion. Um, we said that we, I don't know if it's an item, an emergency, but then. we said we'd have that uh, marriage equality resolution. So I don't that, know. That's that the Oh, but, but, but have it in yeah. the next, if, I don't know if we need to discuss it or. Just no, <coughs> I, I'm just asking, asking you guys to get it, just have it in the packet, just okay. so citizens can see it. Great. Um, <coughs> what about the tap fees? Is that, are we ready for that? No. Okay. And I really do, I, we will, I really do want to work on having having our agenda set, trying to set our agenda tonight so that I'm not getting requests for additional agenda items through the week because then I have to make a decision yeah. if they, it should be added to the agenda and I don't like to do that. Um, so I am looking at you, Marianne. Because I, I, well, I said last week, um, at our last council meeting, I said I wanted to make a report. Okay. Um, and I guess, I okay, I just, um, I mean, this is, I cannot believe we're at 1030. Um, <laughs> this, I thought this was going to be a really fast agenda. Um, okay, um, I guess we're done. Uh, can I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. aye.